Fine. Great, great. Yes. So Navamita is also here. Hi, Navamita, can you hear and see me? Yeah, I can see you and I can hear you. Lovely. So Navamita is, is, uh, is the session chair, so she's the boss. She's going to uh, tell us what to do, when to do, and uh, we are beginning in seven minutes from now. That's the only All right. Topic. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Navamita, you may yeah. Laura, take just over. Uh, usually there are lots of questions. So uh, is it okay? I, I will ask the participants that if some questions are really necessary to be answered in between the talk, then can they stop you and ask questions? During the talk? Yes. Yes, yes, that would be great. Uh, it's okay. better. Okay. Yeah. I will request them that if the question can be uh, deferred till the end of the talk, then they will do that. Okay. So we will roughly go as like 15 minutes of talks and then 10 minutes of questions. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't mind if they interrupt me during the talk. Uh, it's thanks a lot. good. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. So if I understand, uh, then right now you are in Vienna, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah yes. I, um, I'm at the Technical University okay. of Vienna. There are actually two, uh, two. So one is called the University of Vienna and is their historical one. And it, the one I'm at is the Technical University, which is uh, more focused on, you know, okay. on sciences, engineer and stuff. But they are, they are, very close from each other like they are both in the center and uh, okay. yes so in my group there is well in the group where i am there is daniel grumiller and uh, um people working on yeah gravity also anton reban more that's uh, in postdoc right uh actually i uh i'm i will i'm an assistant professor as us Oh, after I tomorrow <laughs> but okay. you couldn't know but yes <laughs> but I, 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 I joined there as a postdoc i joined there as a postdoc uh, yeah. with yeah. the yeah thank god you told me i was just going to tell that you are a postdoc <laughs> thanks no i mean it's it's factually true i mean <laughs> <so>. <laughs> yeah you let me know whenever you will want me to to share a screen. I will. Um, I, I yeah. I will just need to you know to switch this diaporama because I, uh, it will take me a few seconds. But I think you can actually share your screens. I mean, we are like just three minutes away from beginning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. Uh, right. So. There it is, and then So I should I should try to make it fit in fifty minutes, right? So to say. Yeah. yeah, I mean I hope you would not be interrupted a lot in between the talk. But yeah, I mean it's okay if you overgo by five minutes, that's fine. It's not an issue. Okay, yes. If I don't have if I'm not interrupted, I will really try to keep it into fifty minutes. Otherwise you will forgive me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I 
Uh, just to help you a bit, I will uh, let you know uh, 10 minutes in advance. So, so when it would be around 45 minutes, I'll tell you that we are at 45 okay. minutes. Sounds just good. to give you an idea. Because when I give a talk, I generally never have an idea for how long I'm speaking. Yes, yes. <laughs> Okay, so Alok, uh, shall we begin? Oh yes, please, uh, please go ahead. Thanks Alok. Okay, so we are extremely happy to have Laura Done from TU Vienna today joining us for our second review talk in ISM. Uh, I have followed Laura's work from when she was a graduate student and she has done extremely good work uh, on catch space holography. And I'm really happy to have her here today. Laura, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for your kind words. And uh, I would like to thank all the organizers for the invitation to present this uh, review talk on this program, which is called Celestial Holography, which um, proposes a holographic duality for quantum gravity in asymptotically flat space times in terms of a theory, which is still um, to be discovered, but that goes under the name of a celestial conformal field theory that lives on the sphere at infinity. So the motivation or my personal motivation for, for this program and in general for, um, for physics it has to do with black holes as um, it's, it's a fact that black holes are compelling us to reconsider the fundamental laws of nature and are keen on our understanding of quantum gravity. And I think it's fair to say that um, the spectacular advances that have been made in understanding these amazing objects in our universe uh, goes hand in the hand with the holographic principle. The holographic principle proposes that a theory of quantum gravity is actually encoded in a different theory that does not involve gravity and lives in a lower dimensional spacetime. And um, we, want, we would like to understand how general this principle is um, and to, to, to do that, we need to go beyond the canonical cases. Um, indeed, the most concrete realization of this principle is, as you know, given by the anti deceder conformal field theory correspondence, um, which holds for uh, space time, which are anti deceder namely with a negative cosmological constant. Now, um, the purpose of, of the program that I will present now is to extend this paradigm for space-time which are asymptotically flat, namely which have zero uh, cosmological constant. Of course, we know that we live in a deciduous space-time uh, with a positive uh, cosmological constant, but zero uh, lambda is an excellent approximation for, uh, for physics from collider physics to astrophysical scales uh, smaller than cosmological scales. So this will be the focus of, 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 of this review talk. And in particular, we would like to understand 
whether there is a sense in which quantum gravity in flat space time accepts a holographic uh, dual theory, where this theory live and what are its properties. So as I said, um, the, in the last years has emerged a program which is called celestial holography, which uh, proposes a concrete realization for uh, what it means to be for quantum gravity to be holographic in asymptotically flat spacetime. And this program has been motivated by a lot of uh, work and discoveries about the infrastructure of gravity and gay theory that I will try uh, to review. Um, so this will be basically the plan of the talk will be to review these features. And before I dive it into the core of, of celestial holography. So I want to say that you're very welcome to interrupt me at any moment to ask questions or make comments. So uh, the roadmap that I will use for, 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 uh, for this presentation is, is, has to do with symmetries. As we know, symmetries is, is always a good idea to look at the symmetry of a problem. And if, if one think of this as being really the, the, the prime principle that we want to follow, uh, a very first question one should ask before uh, diving into uh, even trying to understand holography is what are the symmetries of asymptotically flat space times? And surprisingly, uh, this question is not yet answered fully there actually. Uh, but it was partially answered in the very old works uh, of, of, of people in general relativity in the 60s that I, I want to, to present because this is really at the core of, of celestial holography. So let me, let me do that. Um, so I, I will first introduce uh, my conventions for coordinate systems and, and, and so on. So uh, here I've written uh, just starting with exactly flat or Minkowski metric in four uh, dimens space-time dimensions, which is described in terms of these coordinates, sometimes called um, Bondi coordinates, where you can see that it involves the time. Here, U is a retarded time. It's basically T minus R. R is a radial um, coordinate. And I will use, instead of the usual theta and phi angles for the round sphere, these complex or stereographic coordinates Z and Z bar. In terms of this coordinate, the round sphere metric uh, takes this form. So a very important uh, diagram in this talk will be the Penrose diagram of Minkowski space, um, where uh, the space time has been contactified and the causal structure preserved. So the boundary of Minkowski space um, is called a future is this future null infinity, which is this null hypersurface denoted by this letter uh, scry plus, which is um, the boundary that you, you go to when you take this retarded time constant and take the radial uh, distance very big. Now in this diagram, uh, massless particle always propagate along lines of 45 degrees. So future null infinity is the location where all massless particle end their life. Um, each uh, point in, in this diagram is actually um, a, a two-sphere labeled by this angle Z and Z bar. Similarly, there is a past null infinity where all masses particles come from. And um, the, the, the boundary of, of Minkowski space is given so by this real line spined by the time coordinate U times a sphere, a two-sphere, which is called the celestial sphere. So the celestial sphere, the asymptotic sphere um, at the boundary of flat space-time and will play a very important role in this, in this talk. So um, now uh, we would like to understand not exactly uh, purely flat Minkowski metric, but what people have called asymptotically flat space-times, which are space-time which, which have a curvature and but which look like Minkowski uh, in the first approximation. And the deviation from the Minkowski line element is given by boundary condition from the metric. So in first approximation, this is just Minkowski space plus some correction, which it's a one over R expansion 
which involve a bunch of a function here that I will recall. So um, this function in blue here are arbitrary function of the retarded time and the angles. And this MB function is called the Bondi mass aspect. It's an arbitrary function of U Z bar, which roughly speaking encodes the energy of the system. Similarly, uh, so if you take a curl cur black hole, MB will just be a constant. It will be the mass of the black hole. Now, uh, NZ is the angular momentum aspect. And very importantly, this function here, C, is called the asymptotic shear or gravitational data indicates the presence of gravitational radiation. More precisely, if the time derivative of this function is non-zero, it means that the system you are describing is emitting gravitational radiation, like for instance, black hole merger will emit gravitational wave. This wave will propagate and exit space-time at future null infinity, and you will be able to measure uh, this by uh, this quantity. So this asymptotically flat space-time uh, written like that describes uh, space-time which are emitting radiation. Now, a very prime question is what is the symmetric group of these kind of space times. And what you might expect or what was expected was actually to recover the Poincaré group, which is the isometric group of Minkowski space given by four translations and six Lorentz transformations. What was found indeed, at, um, it was a very big surprise in the general relativity community is instead um, the so-called BMS group standing from Bondi, Messner and Zacks which is an infinite dimensional extension of the Poincaré group. So how does, does this infinite dimensional extension uh, appear? Well, what you do when you look at uh, asymptotic symmetries is um, you're really uh, looking for vector fields which preserve this asymptotic expansion. So what it means is that the rules of the game is that you're allowed to change this function in blue here, but you are not allowed to change the powers in R in the expansion. There is also some gauge fixing at, at play, but I will not enter into too much subtleties. But when you do that, you, you find that the following vector fields, which is called a super translation vector field, preserve this form of metric. And the important thing about this vector field that it involves an arbitrary function F uh, of, of the angles. And uh, because this function f is arbitrary, um, basically you are allowed to shift the retarded time by an infinite amount of, of functions uh, instead of the usual translation where you just shift uh, by a constant. So that means that you have an infinite amount of, 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 of freedom of, of, of doing so. That's why the BMS group is an infinite dimensional extension of the Poincaré group. So that's the very first important conclusion is that the symmetry group of asymptotically flat spacetime is much bigger than the one of Minkowski space. And this infinite dimensional extension of Poincaré is called the BMS group. Yes, is there a question? No, probably there was a microphone. All right. So, so you, have, you see that um, in Prince, because you have a boundary in the spacetime, that you have a symmetry enhancement phenomenon, which we are familiar. Uh, if you think of ADS3, uh, the symmetry group is the, is the infinite dimensional Vera Zorro, two dimensional copy, two copies of the Vera Zorro symmetry. Here is a, it's an analogous phenomenon for flat space time. And uh, let me point out that the symmetry were originally totally disregarded. More than that, if you look at the paper from Zacks in the 60s, uh, people were very annoyed, annoyed by this. They really wanted to recover the Poincaré group. And they say, you see that I told you that the feature of super translation is that it there involves an arbitrary function of the angles. Zacks were saying, you see, it's, it's pretty annoying that we have this function. So we are, you, we are trying, we have been trying to kill this function to impose other, other kind of uh, boundary condition for the metric so that the group reduces to, to Poincaré. But they were kind of honest uh, in the sense that they said, we tried to, to kill the symmetry, but we have failed to do so. And really, they didn't know what to do uh, with the symmetry. 
But as Zach said, maybe the fact that there is super translation is actually a blessing in disguise and the stories is actually more interesting than, um, than, the, than what we, we could have expected. And indeed, the presence of these symmetries is actually um, has played a fundamental role in understanding the infrared uh, structure of gravity and gauge theories. And to, to show you that, uh, let me recall this uh, story that was um, first pointed out by Andy Strominger a couple of years ago, is that the symmetries are actually the imprint uh, of soft theorems in quantum field theory. Uh, soft theorems are statements about amplitudes which involve uh, what is called a soft particle, namely a particle uh, which, uh, which have zero energy. So here you have, say, an amplitude with n particle, a scattering amplitude with n particle. You, you add an extra particle which has zero energy, which is called soft. And the soft theorems is a statement that this amplitude will factorize, namely will be given by the amplitude without the soft insertion times a factor here um, called the, the soft factor, which has here a pole in one over omega. So uh, this is something studied by Weinberg and other people in quantum field theory. So a priori has nothing to do with general relativity. But what you can uh, actually see is that the leading subgraviton theorem has a symmetry uh, interpretation and indeed uh, is nothing but the word identity, which is associated to super translation symmetry. Um, so there is a precise mathematical statement to show that this theorem uh, arises from this wide identity involving the netter charge associated to, to super translation symmetry spanned by the, the function f here. Uh, there are a couple of steps involved uh, that I, I, I don't want to, to develop, but there is really a precise mathematical statement. And actually, uh, the story uh, is even richer than that because, and, and this goes under the name of so-called infrared triangle developed um, by Strominger and collaborators, which establishes a set of relationship between these three topics in physics. The first one, uh, this asymptotic symmetry, is, um, is this uh, statement about infinite dimensional enhancement in general relativity. And the second one is this soft theorems in quantum field theory. Uh, and uh, uh, very remarkably, uh, there is also an observ observational, um, an observational uh, imprint of, these, uh, of these, uh, these features, which is known as uh, the memory effect. So the memory effect is uh, something that was predicted just from looking at um, Einstein's equation by these people in the, in the 70s, and is the fact that um, um, detectors which detect gravitational waves will undergo a permanent dis, uh, relative displacement long after the gravitational wave has passed. So this is, for instance, uh, the signal that in, in, in red that you will get, how you would measure this effect. For instance, if you have um, a signal at, at LIGO, you will see uh, that long after the wave has passed, there will be a residual net displacement that you can measure. And it's expected, this effect is expected to be measured uh, in the next uh, couple of years at LIGO or LISA. So you have uh, this very beautiful set of relationships and this carries on not only for gravity, but also for gauge theories in different amount of space-time dimensions. Uh, so it's, a, it's supposed to be a very um, fundamental feature or, of the infrared structure of, of gauge theory and gravity. And th this has really was at the core of the celestial holography program that I, I want to present, if there is no question at this, at this stage. Yeah, I don't see any question. Please go Okay, ahead. great. I, could, could I ask briefly, so, sorry? Is sure, that... sure. Yeah. Uh, we, when, when we study ADS, we allow for boundary conditions that are more general than normalizable states. We allow for non-normalizable deformations, which then have some interpretation, right? Deforming by operators. So I was wondering whether there is something like the analog of a non-normalizable deformation of your boundary conditions. 
something that does not is not some finite energy kind of space time but is of interest anyway for some for some reason yes uh, actually uh, this is a very important feature actually because one of the question that yeah that you might you might ask is what is the if you want what is the analog of uh, the bms symmetry for it i mean how come that you know you could you could think that you, you might want to see these symmetries or this feature of a flat space time coming from, let's say, a, a large ADS radius limit of the story in ADS. And, and, and typically, I mean, this is a long story, so maybe I want to expand too much on that, but there, there has been some effort trying to uh, precisely understand which kind of boundary condition in ADS you need to impose. So you need you will need to allow for fluxes of outgoing radiation and um, and uh, strongly relaxing these boundary conditions will will give you some sort of BMS symmetry in the in the limit. So this and and the non-numberability of the state is tightly connected to that. So but I think it's it's a very interesting to always try to to relate what we know from ADS and 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 see how 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 the story goes on from from flat space time and the story is very subtle and it's a long story but yeah I hope I I more or less uh, answer the question. If there is no other question, we can come back to that in the discussion. Is there, um, is there any relationship between large large diffusive morphisms and the BMS group? Uh, like the large gauge transformations? Yes, so BMS symmetries are large, what people call large diffeomorphisms in the sense that uh, they have a non, there, there are many ways to, 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 to express this statement. One way is to say that um, they have a non-zero non charge associated to them. This, uh, this another charge that is non-zero at the boundary, or you can say that the, the asymptotic symmetry parameter is not zero when uh, at the boundary, but yet yeah, this is precisely how people have called them sometimes non-proper um, transformations. And uh, so this is precisely what they are. Could they be the coset of the large diffeomorphisms with the small diffeomorphisms? Yeah, so this is another way of saying, so do you have basically two approach, either you look at what is called residual gauge uh, transformations or diffeomorphisms, which are uh, the thing you obtain by first starting to fix the gauge. Uh, here I was working in bounded gauge, but you might think of other kinds of gauges. Or you look at the quotient of the so-called um, asymptotic uh, symmetry mod, mod out by the trivial ones. And these are uh, eventually leading to the same result. But yes, these are two different ways of defining these large case transformations. Thanks. OK. Thanks for the question. Uh, so now let, let's go into the core of the celestial holography. Um, so a very prime observation is that, so here I've rewritten again our Penrose diagram, is that the four dimensional Lorentz groups act on the celestial sphere on this coordinate Z and Z bar as the two dimensional conformal group. This is just a statement, a fact about, um, about symmetries. Uh, so this is just the Möbius transformation on Z and there is an analogous thing on, on Z bar. So um, somehow um, by construction, if you go to a, to a boost eigenstate uh, basis, you will have that um, object will naturally transform as uh, 2D conformal uh, with 2D conformal properties. And this is indeed uh, what is at the core of celestial holography. So more precisely, um, this is um, a statement that the four-dimensional space-time S matrix can be encoded in a theory uh, that we will call a celestial conformal field theory. So the word celestial uh, is there for two purposes. Basically, the first one is to tell you that uh, it lives on the celestial sphere. So this is the asymptotic two-dimensional sphere at infinity. And the word is also there to indicate that, uh, as you will see, there are many features of this theory which are unconventional compared to usual CFT. So 
to which extent this thing is actually a, a, a differ from a usual 2D CFT is actually one of the main challenges of the program. And people are actively working on that. Um, but so let's let's take this idea seriously and 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 let's see how far how far we can go. Namely, can we? Um, what happens if we recast the scattering uh, elements of 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 the the, the S matrix in in for the quantum gravity in terms of uh, a correlation function? So this is a correlation function in this to the celestial CFT, which involve a bunch of operators, which will be labeled by the point Z and Z bar at which the particle enters or exists space times, and a bunch of quantum numbers, namely their conformal dimension, their spin. So you can actually, because of the symmetry uh, observation I mentioned before, if you work in a boost, I can, um, uh, in a boost uh, basis, you will have that naturally the object will transform uh, with some sort of conformal property. So this motivated the use of these uh, bases, which I call the holographic uh, bases, which involves, so in crucially in this program, uh, there is this integral transform, which is called the Mellin transform, which is a Mellin transform of the energy of the particle. So, if you have a plane wave, so I, I, here I will focus on massless, uh, on the massless case, there is an analogous story for massive states. I'm not presenting that because I don't have time, but, um, but you can think that this story mutatis mutandis carries through uh, for massive states, but let me focus on massless um, case. So, there are then there are you can parameterize their null momentum p mu in terms of their energy and the point z at z bar at which the particle is pointing is heading to so again i recall that each massless particle will pierce the celestial sphere at the point z and z bar now if you do this malian transform uh, very remarkably the nice thing about that is that now um the object you will get which i call o here will now not depend any longer of the energy, but now will depend of this delta, which is a conformal dimension, as indeed this object now transform manifestly under SL2C as a, a, a primaries of weights H and H bar, which are respectively the sum and differences uh, of the dimension, the spin. So here, this was for a, a massless uh, object, but if you have spin, you will have a four-dimensional helicity factor in front of that, and the the two D spin is simply identified with uh, with the four-dimensional helicity. So this is just to say that we will work in a basis which makes the conformal transformation of the asymptotic state manifest. The price to pay is that now the translation symmetry will be obscured uh, because of this, this Malian integral. Um, right, so is there any question about that? If not, I will, I will, um, I will carry on with the celestial currents. So if not, um, let me tell you about these currents because they are actually important. So now we will be working with objects which are uh, labeled by uh, weights h and h bar, remembering that they also um, express in, they, they will also be the point z and z bar of the celestial sphere. And very remarkably, what you you can construct object which transform as current on the celestial sphere, when now you take uh, what we call a conformally soft limits, which is a limit. Um, uh, obtained by uh, taking the conformal dimension to take some integer values. Because you see, a, a soft, where was a soft particle? Before a soft particle, uh, a soft particle has omega goes to zero. But now when you work in this new basis, it's no longer clear what you mean by a soft particle because basically you have traded the energy for, for a conformal dimension delta. So do you still have a notion of softness to some extent in this in, in, on the celestial sphere. And the statement is that yes, 
And this, this thing is precisely captured by integer uh, di uh, values for the conformal dimension. And so in particular, you can construct currents uh, which transform nicely and encode actually uh, soft theorems uh, in celestial holography. So let's take a spin one particle and take the conformalist soft limit delta goes to one. Then you can see directly from the weights so delta is one and j is one, that you will have an object which has uh, weights one comma zero. And this object precisely plays the role of the U1 catch Moody current on the celestial sphere. And in the insertion of this operator into um, a correlation function on the celestial sphere is actually encoding um, precisely Weinberg subphoton theorem. So if you want, um, there is, I told you before, there was an, um, a precise way in, uh, in which the, the, pre, the wire identity associated to asymptotic symmetries were in one-to-one -one with the soft theorems. And here in this basis, we can recover this, this statement, but uh, using objects which really are currents or conformally soft um, objects uh, for specific deltas. So this is for QAD. Now for gravity, um, you have this super translation symmetry is actually pretty subtle to deal with because if the, the current that, that is playing an important role is actually a descendant of, of, of the object with delta equal to one. So it's an object which has three half, one half. And Indeed, the insertion of this super translation current gives you uh, here written in the operator product expansion form, it is encoding the Weinberg's leading soft graviton theorem. And you can see that the, because we are in this basis, I told you that the, the, the translation symmetry is getting a little bit tricky. And indeed, inserting this object amounts to shifting the weights of the, of the operator on the celestial sphere of one half uh, each. So you can see that already now we have some feature which are non not conventional from the usual uh, CFT perspective. And remarkably, there is another important occurrence in, in the game, which is the two-dimensional uh, stress tensor. Um, so the stress tensor of the celestial CFT is actually what is called a shadow transform of, of the conformal primary of weights delta equals zero. So um, the shadow transform is an integral transform. This is actually just what it is for, for this case. The shadow transform is, is typically uh, an integral transform that maps a primary with weights uh, with weight uh, delta to a new primary with weight two minus delta for 2D CFT. And so when you do that to this operator, you will indeed uh, obtain an object which has weight two comma zero. And the operator product expansion of this of the celestial uh, CFT stress tensor with any operator on the, on the celestial sphere gives you as expected the precisely um, the OPE of, uh, of a stress tensor in a 2D CFT. So, um, this, this object has a precise, um, let's say, um, can, can be mapped to, uh, to the object in the gravitational solution space in a kind of intricate way because this is it's a non local, um, is, an, is non local in terms of the gravitational solution space. But it's pretty remarkable that there is a current which, uh, which is playing the role of a stress tensor. So now this is, this is a summary. So of the thing I, I just introduced. So I told you we work in this, in this basis, objects, uh, the particles will be uh, interpreted as being operators on the celestial sphere, labeled by uh, weights and points on the sphere. And remarkably, we can construct uh, conformally me, soft. Yes, yes, please. Hi, sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, just on the previous slide, uh, mm -hmm. You define this T as an integral or uh, transform, the shadow transform of operator O. Now, what is the uh, state which maps to this O? Yes, so it's just this, this O 
yeah. is yeah. roughly speaking is mel is the is the spin to elicity times the in that times the the melon transform of a plane waves basically so that's the graviton the graviton yeah exactly okay the graviton you. yes exactly so all these o's here are up to sub sub subtleties basically melon transform of of um of asymptotic states which are taken to be plane waves and melon integrated yes okay thank you Uh, is there another question? I see one. one hand. Yeah, uh, I, I have one question. Uh, like, do you have the understanding of the central charge of the CFT? Say, do you have the OP expansion of the two stress tensor? Yes. Uh, yes. Thanks for the question. Yes, we we do have it, and uh, basically C zero. <laughs> that, that's just to answer uh, uh, fast. So these. So okay, let me let me let me say something. It's like, so people have been computed um, uh, the OPE of T with T in mm -hmm. different ways. Uh, I will come back to the when I will present uh, celestial OPEs. But um, basically, uh, what you can do is that you can. Uh, Stieberger and Taylor have looked at. Um, uh, as at, at OPE of T with T by taking you, what you need to do is you need to take, of course, um, two conformally of limits because you have two stress tensor and you need also to take a core linear limit. I will talk about that later uh, to uh, obtain the OPE. And they found that the OPE with T with T is the one you expect with central charge zero uh, okay, by looking yeah, at like, uh, like yes. Yeah, I expect that possibly one can read up this thing start starting from double soft graviton theorem, say, when you have two soft gravitons and like if you take either simultaneous or uh, maybe consecutive, like the, from there one yes. can extract this OP coefficient of like of two stress tensors, right? Yes, and, yes. It's basically you are telling this, it's zero? Yeah. Yes, this was found to be zero. Yeah. Okay, so at you. least, the, yeah, exactly. Uh, and as you know, I might mention that uh, as you surely know, there is the in the usual energy momentum basis, there is this these uh, uh, ambiguities on how you take consecutive or you know um, double uh, double self limit. You know there was this there was an interesting paper by Disler Horn and and others that um, you know there is this ambiguity whether which limit which guy you take first, uh, soft first, and so on and so forth. Actually, in the in this melin basis, this holographic basis, the disambiguity it's is is somehow uh, doesn't doesn't show up. So you can do the things in a in a in a neat in a neat way. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. But indeed, so it's, it's essentially this double soft limit. Yeah. Does this mean that? Uh... The entropy, if you calculate the entropy of uh, of the celestial sphere, uh, you won't you you will see zero going by the Cardi formula or something. Well, yeah. So so far we don't have any, you know, we don't have any black hole or stuff in the, that's this is you. This is what you have in mind. So so far, so what it means is that at least at least. At this classical, I mean, semi-classical level, the the central charge of this um, celestial CFT has to be zero. And actually, from you know, it could by somehow, um, you know, if you think of it like, with what could it be? Because you know, in ADS, you have this brown and no central charge, which is basically three L over two G, where L is the ADS radius. Here, there is no scale to compensate it, so it should somehow be um, zero or infinity. And, and actually you can see that is zero also from, uh, I also worked on that with Romaru Ziconi from Vienna. You can also see this from the, from, the, from the algebra, from the BMS algebra. There is a long story be, behind all that because there, there was found that there was um, a non-trivial uh, two-co-cycle between the super translation and super rotations. And 
there might be other kind of central extensions which appear at other places. Um, uh, yeah, there, we, we can go into that in the discussion session if you want to, because there is another guy which is actually a shadow stress tensor that might have a sort of off diagonal central charge. But uh, at least the statement is that T with T as written there, the, the C is zero. Right. Okay. But this is all very interesting uh, questions and points to make. All right, so so yeah, I mean, the, the, so these currents, uh, as I said, encode very naturally uh, soft theorem. So they, they're really the building block of the soft sector of, of celestial CFT. And let me make some comments that you can actually relate them in very naturally with the, with the object of the solution space because Let's, let's not forget where we come from. We, we are coming from, uh, in gravity, we have this uh, solution space, which encode um, um, the notion of asymptotic flat space time. We have very concrete things, which are bondy mass aspect, angular momentum aspect, and the shear. Um, and by looking at what, what we wanted to emphasize, that looking at the so-called fluxes, which has which are the U integrated of the time derivative of, of gravitational solution space uh, objects. Uh, you can act, this is the, actually the, the pre, you can make a precise map between these fluxes and the celestial currents that I have uh, mentioned before. So by definition, these fluxes are also, uh, this is sort of tautological statement. They are the difference uh, of, of um, of their value at the future of future null infinity square plus plus when u goes to plus infinity and uh, the difference of that with the, the objects at the past of future null infinity namely square plus minus. All right, so now there has been a very uh, interesting uh, recent work on the idea that actually these currents, uh, so I, I, I've mentioned a couple of, of, of them for you, but that there is an actually an infinite tower of currents uh, for all these values of the conform my dimension delta. And very nicely, you can, uh, Storminger show that you can reorganize all this tower of currents by a clever field, by a clever redefinition of the generators in terms of uh, W uh, one plus infinity algebra. And there is also a beautiful story that uh, was worked out uh, from a twister space uh, analysis. Um, because I, as you can say, it, so the, it's, it's obvious that twister space is a very, uh, it's a van, va very natural language to understand all, all this feature. And, and to some extent, Penrose has probably already talked about this, this, these things in a different language. So this is, I found it very beautiful that we have, you know, all these sort of different communities and subfields that are now talking to each other basically about, about the same things. And it's very nice to see a relationship between, between all that. So I'm not an expert on that, but I found it very, very, uh, very nice. So yeah, I mean, uh, basically this, the, the, the main conclusion of this part is that these, uh, these currents that lives on the celestial sphere and how they are organized uh, give you a powerful principle to, to see how um, the soft sector of the S matrix is, is captured and basically um, how all these symmetries uh, organize themselves in a nice way. So before I, I, I'm almost at the end of, of what I wanted to say, and I would try to make some, um, some uh, general comments, but before that, I, I have to mention um, the work, a lot of works that have been done on the, on the amplitude sides. So I'm sorry, I, I forgot probably a lot of people. This is the, the, the field is developing very fast and it's, it's difficult to keep track of everything that's been do, uh, going on. But basically, uh, there has been a lot of effort developed on, on you know, uh, melin transforming uh, scattering amplitudes and see uh, what that it takes the form of a correlation function. And they use from that a lot of try to constrain, you know, from a sort of bottom up approach, try to 
see what it implies on the what constraint it implies on the dual uh, putative theory. So what you can do is, as I was mentioning uh, briefly before, you can actually see very easily that a collinear limit. So when you take um, uh, the moment of two particles to to become uh, parallel, then do you, this is actually equivalent uh, to uh, taking the points on the celestial sphere um, to coincide. So in other words, collinear limits of for the amplitudes correspond to a celestial operator product expansion in the celestial CFT. And there has been, um, and you can either brute force, you know, uh, these, these, these things by, you know, many transform the amplitude, taking collinear limits, and see that it gives you, um, it constrains the OP coefficients, or you can just also try to uh, see what are the OP coefficient from symmetry, just from symmetry uh, principles. Um, low point celestial amplitudes are um, inherently uh, endowed with kinematic singularities uh, because you have a bunch of delta functions there that, um, that remain. And there have been some efforts uh, trying to tame these uh, singularities by using of, of so-called shadow, uh, light, and twister transforms uh, by several of these people. There has been some work uh, on conformal block expansion, many things to mention, and also on the UVIR behavior of celestial amplitudes. Because as you, as you could see, because I'm doing this Melin integral, I'm really, we are really probing all energies. So celestial amplitude intrinsically involves a mixing between the UV and the IR. And this is very interesting to look at the implication of this uh, statement uh, for the celestial theory. So um, I'm reaching the end uh, of, of the talk. So I think I still have, um, Few minutes to 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 review. Yeah, you have time. Go ahead. Great. <clears throat> yes. So I mean, really, what I what I wanted to 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 show is that physics in the deeper universe is much richer and much less understood than we thought. Uh, so there there is this BMS symmetry, the super translation symmetry. Now I think it's well understood. But there are other kinds of, uh, of, of symmetries that I didn't really talk about. But now a question is, uh, what is the full uh, symmetries of quantum gravity in asymptotic flat space time? And as I said, this question is not actually, is only partially answered. Um, and celestial holography really aims at putting the symmetry front and center in the, in the, in the program. And it's really by following these, these symmetries that um, this program aims at understanding uh, whether uh, what is the holographic principle for quantum gravity in, uh, in flat space times in terms of a two-dimensional uh, theory. So I, I, independently of, of holography, uh, I think a lot of people have been very excited about celestial amplitudes as they are now, um, we can see that somehow, you know, you might think you might just work in a different basis, but actually it turns out very uh, fruitful because uh, the celestial uh, amplitudes are showing hidden mathematical, mathematical structure that you could not see before. And um, also allow you to understand uh, things from a new perspective, like for instance, these double copy relationships and, and so on and so forth. So independently of the holography, uh, uh, I, this, this is, if you want, a new, a new window into, into amplitudes. And to me, what I find very interesting about this program is just it, it is forcing us to, to address the principle of holography beyond what we know from ADS. Um, because, you know, usually in ADS, I mean, we do not allow the escape of gravitation of radiation. We, we say, you know, ADS act like a box, but um, I think we do want to understand physical systems which are emitting gravitational uh, waves. And 
and celestial holography is forcing us to address this question uh, and to allow for uh, outgoing fluxes. And by doing so, you see that you, you run out to new features about, about holography. So you have to somehow extend this paradigm to allow for these cases. And in particular, um, in celestial holography, you have this extra symmetry that is this super translation symmetry, which have no an analog in usually the SCFT. And uh, it gives rise to this intriguing feature, for instance, the fact that the symmetry is, you know, is shifting, um, is, is the shifting the dimension of the operator uh, in the spectrum. And we have to deal with that. There is no, no way around it. Um, so this raises the question to which extent celestial conformal field theory resemble or differ from, from the usual uh, CFT, from ADS CFT. And this way we have to, we have to understand. So um, there are very many 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 things uh, to, that are left to to be done. Um, by the way, uh, I didn't cover all aspects, of course, of the, of the program. Uh, there are many many people working on that. So again, I'm sorry that I had to focus on only certain aspects of that. And let me mention a few uh, challenges that are ahead for, for this program. So the very first uh, question is actually, what is a celestial CFT? Because uh, I, I, I told you how you could somehow uh, build from the bottom up uh, properties or constraints, uh, for instance, coming from these infinite towers of symmetries, coming from the soft sector. Uh, but we would we would want to do more than that, right? We would like to to have at, at least an intrinsic definition of what is a celestial CFT, or at least what are the list of properties that it should obey. Uh, now there is also this very interesting question: uh, whether uh, string theory is actually the only consistent uh, theory of quantum gravity in in flat space. So, so far it has been um, observed that even at a tree level, uh, string theory amplitude are sufficiently well behaved in the UV to admit a celestial representation. And it would be very nice to understand what is the precise relationship between the string wall sheet and the celestial uh, CFT. So there have been some recent uh, works on that, but the, 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 the question is still to be, to be uh, investigated further. And, and finally, uh, so this was so far just, you know, um, uh, assembly flat space time. But of course, I mean, the, 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 the big picture would be eventually to involve black holes into the game and to see to which extent or what, what can celestial holography tell us about, about black hole formation and evaporation is, of course, the very uh, ambitious uh, question uh, to, to, to solve, but this is tightly related to another program that I was personally involved in, which has to do with this uh, black hole soft hair. And basically a very uh, natural question is to understand what are the global forms of the conservation laws in the presence of black holes, which are consistent with all, all, all these uh, celestial symmetries. So uh, I'm done and thank you very much for listening and I will take any question you have. Thank you, Laura. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. So we really have time. Uh, please go ahead. I can see uh, uh, Shomdato, you can ask a question. Yeah, so uh, I want to go back to that point of uh, getting a zero central charge because even a Schwarzschild black hole, for instance, is asymptotically is is asymptotically flat, right? The space time is asymptotically flat. So, uh, from the celestial see, celestial point of view, you should be able to see the entropy of the black hole by measuring, for instance, the outgoing radiation, for instance. So, uh, so you should be able to see some entropy. But if the central charge is zero, does it mean that you don't? I'm really confused about this point. Can you please explain? Yes, so this is basically, you know, this this is a question that I mean, this this would require basically understanding the last point, right? I mean, because there are, you know, you know, all all these all these conservation laws, or for instance, 
all these um, things that I was talking about, like these, um, these, uh, the fact that the 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 celestial CFT has to be uh, consistent with the with the with the conservation laws and all all this tower of symmetry. Now, in the presence of the black hole. Um, you know, a scry future knife is no longer a Cauchy surface, and you will have to include the the, um, the contribution from the horizon, and you will have to really arrive. I mean, the it the, when the black hole is there, uh, all these uh, it will have to obey all these conservation laws, but you expect that there will be a contribution of the horizon to say the charge, even the classical charges would get a contribution for, for the black hole horizon. So you will need to, uh, you know, to en en encapsulate this. And so far, we don't have access to the full story. I mean, you know, I'm not saying that, you know, and, and to which extent the usual Cardi formula story or cardiology will work. I mean, it's, 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 still, a, it's still an open question. OK, thanks. Uh, Shiraz is? Is, is that you? I Hello. cannot. Yeah, Hello. please go. Ahead. Please go yes. uh, hi, Laura. Uh, thanks for a very nice talk. Uh, so at, in one of these uh, uh, slides towards the end, you talk about a conform block expansion. So what sort of operators you expect would appear in such an expansion? Um, in particular, is there any uh, uh, spe special role played by the so-called unitary principle series? Um, yes, so I have to say that this is not my work, so I'm not an expert on these on these things, but um, but indeed all these 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 principal series typically uh, typically play 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 an important role. Now I know that about this um, the spectrum of the conformal block is not fully yet understood. As far as I know, they have been they might have been some recent papers addressing that. Uh, so then I would refer to the work of you know, Strominger, Raclario, and also Stieberger and Taylor. Uh, but, uh, but yes, we expect that indeed this, this principal series where delta is one plus i times the real number is, is always playing a role. But, you know, there has been all this question about how to deal with the, well, basically what is the, the right thing to look at, whether you want to include also um, the shadow primaries, the light transform, and all that. So, it's it's uh, it's yeah, it's under yes. investigation. Yeah, because this delta just appeared as a number in your transform, right? Which could have been picked to be anything. Uh, yes, in principle, exactly. So, in principle, yes. Thanks. I, so I should clarify that so the delta is arbitrary. Now, uh, the statement about this delta lying on the principle series. Um, is really um, a statement that is coming from asking that um, the plane waves so uh -huh. form a, a normalizable uh, basis. So if you translate this statement, this is uh -huh. this translation of this statement in the Mellin transform basis that is telling you that delta is, is lies on the principal series. But of course, uh, we know that we want to there are other objects which do not lie on the principal series. So with Sabrina Pastersky and Andrea Poon, we try to, to, to show that you can, there is a sense in which you can analytically continue this delta to any, any value. Because you see, there is this, this translation symmetry is shifting delta by one already. Yeah. So it, it takes you off immediately. Even the usual translation takes you off of the principal series. Hmm. Um, okay. And uh, the stress tensor obviously is not on the on the principal series either. So, yeah. I see. Uh, one more question. So the four point function, for example, uh, is supported only on a particular slice of this cross ratio space, right? Namely, z equal to z bar as a exactly. consequence of, uh, I guess, translational symmetry in the bulk. That's true. Yeah, yeah. So, so the two to two scattering, yeah, it forces you to uh, to. The cross ratio is, is constrained to be yeah, eta equal eta bar. Or something. So I yeah. guess the more general question is like uh, these properties of uh, C this, uh, CFTs, they are, they are, have they been understood uh, to some extent from bottom up or, or, or that's going on? 
if they have been understood from which perspective sorry? from from the bottom up uh, perspective i like let's say i mean what kind of uh, oh, yeah. uh, you know axioms that i should start with to to get a ccft which which is uh, doing the job of producing scattering amplitudes yeah exactly so this would what we call top down rather like you know i, I would say that what we're doing is bottom up oh, okay like, sorry yes yeah yeah but that depends on what if you're upside down. i don't know but uh yeah uh yeah exactly so it's it has been uh, mostly done that i think there have been some some efforts you know in uh, trying to come up with a more intrinsic definition or toy model of celestial cft uh and that's precisely what what i, I was uh, listing here in the in the challenges yeah. ahead. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, we have two more minutes. Amitabh, you can go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, Laura. Thank you for the nice talk. So uh, on this last uh, slide in the last comment, you mentioned about uh, black hole software and conservation laws. So you, you do mention about the super translation conservation laws. But what about these W symmetries? You expect W symmetries to be also realized in these black hole space times and conservation laws for these W symmetries will also involve contributions from the horizon. What is your view? Yeah, I would have, I would, I, I would say that whatever, you know, <laughs> that the black hole will have, we will not have a choice. You know, you put it in the space time, it will have to, to, he cannot violate the conservation. Well, he will change because of this contribution from the horizon, but but you will have to be consistent with all these symmetries, uh, whatever he wants it or not. So since this infinite uh, one plus infinity, W1 plus infinity algebra shows up, I mean, I expect it will play a role. To how precisely, I don't know. I would like to know. I mean, I'm working to try to understand how, you know, this is the big picture of how, how, how these two program, you know, you've been also working on this software and charges at the horizon will uh, will uh, contribute and how to make all these two picture one unique one okay thanks uh, okay uh, thank you laura uh, we can have more questions taken in the discussion session uh, laura i would request you to be there because i think there will be more questions okay yep. so right thanks. i would be there thank you thank uh, you I'm, you're welcome uh, we'll stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, our next speaker is Orindam. Orindam, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you just share your screen? Yes, I'm sharing. Sure. Yeah, so is it visible? Yeah, can you make it full screen? Yeah. So it's okay, right? Okay, yeah, so our next speaker is Arinda. We are very happy to have him here. He is going to tell us about our matrix models with EMS3 constraints. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, I'd like to start by thanking the organizers and the supporting team for this wonderful conference. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to talk about a matrix model with EMS3 constraints. It's based on this recent work that I did with Neetu. And here's a brief outline of the talk. I'll just introduce what BMS3 symmetry is and where we find it. And then I'll talk about matrix models and how matrix models are related to a sort of infinite dimensional algebras through these loop equations. And then I'll talk about uh, how these BMS3 constraints can be imposed in a matrix model partition function through these free field realizations and how those constraints can be solved using CFT techniques. So we'll, uh, we'll solve them and find some partition function for a matrix model. And then I'll interpret that matrix model and give some future directions. So this is a very recent work that we are doing. So all comments and uh, ideas are welcome. So in the previous talk, Laura talked about asymptotic symmetries of gravity theories and how these people in the 60s found an infinite extension of the bulk symmetry at the boundary. And although in 3D, the bulk dynamics is trivial, uh, the seminal work of Brown and Heno showed that for at least ADS3 cases, a similar extension is there. And later, Barnage compared and other people showed that 
this, uh, even in the case of 3D flat, asymptotically flat space times, there is a asymptotic symmetry algebra, which is infinite dimensional and which is this PMS3 algebra. And this is how the algebra looks like. These TNs are the super rotation modes and MNs are the super translation modes. And this algebra, uh, this algebra, this particular symmetry and its generalizations has played central role in understanding uh, flat space holography in 3D. So for instance, a lot of work was devoted to uh, writing 2D duals of this bulk gravity theory using the BMS3 symmetry. And they've also been related to Galilean conformal algebras. And it, this correspondence has been used to calculate the correlation functions, uh, BMS3 invariant correlation functions. And in recent times, BMS3 has also popped up in various other related places. So for instance, in the effective dynamics of black hole interiors, in a class of integrable systems, and even in, in the bosonic sector of tension districts. So this shows that this understand to understand this BMS3 symmetry more is a very interesting question to ask. On the other side is the matrix models, which are zero dimensional quantum field theories whose basic field is a random matrix. So for example, this is a partition function of a, of a matrix model where the integration is over some ensemble E and uh, the, the integration variables are all the uh, elements of the matrix. And this uh, action is essentially an effect, uh, effective potential, which is nothing but a polynomial in these matrices. But you can, uh, what will be particularly useful is the eigenvalue representation of this uh, matrix model. So what you can do is that you can diagonalize these matrices and write this partition function in terms of the eigenvalues of this matrix. And then, uh, then the Jacobian of this transformation sort of appears as a van der determinant here which in, in general can come with some, some exponent beta and depending on the beta, we call it a beta matrix model. And of course, matrix models recently uh, have been extremely uh, important for holography. So in, it was shown by these people that JT gravity, uh, the holographic dual of JT gravity is a, is a random matrix model. And there's, uh, there's been a lot of work uh, uh, throughout uh, where matrix models are related to integrable systems. And through loop equations, there's a special class of matrix models called conformal matrix models, which are connected to infinite dimensional algebra. So this is the connection we have to explore in this talk. So what are loop equations? So the partition function of matrix model that I showed, uh, it should remain invariant under a change of integration to develop this sort. And if you demand that, that puts some constraints on this partition function. And you can write those constraints as some differential operators acting on the partition function. And these, this is what we will call as the loop equation circuits. And the, what you can show is that for conformal matrix models, this complete set of constraints satisfies a closed algebra. Okay, so for instance, if you take the ensemble to be Hermitian ensemble, what you can show is that uh, these uh, differential operators satisfies Pirasov algebra, or rather uh, weight algebra, because there's no central extension. And inversely, the, uh, what you can ask is that, suppose I know the algebra satisfied by the constraints, can I somehow work out what's the partition function uh, for this given matrix model? And the answer is yes, this, is recently, uh, this, has, uh, this was worked out in 90s by these people, in a series of works where they started with a algebra, with a known algebra, and worked out the partition function for which the loop equations satisfies that algebra. So in this talk, our objective is to find a matrix model partition function, which is dual to these BMS3 constraints. So the first step would be to, to find the set of differential operators, which will satisfy BMS3 algebra among them. And the second step would be then to solve these uh, constraints and write a part, write down a partition function. And we'll ultimately write down a partition function in eigenvalue representation. So to do both these steps, we'll extensively use uh, techniques of 2D CFTs. And our starting point is the realization of BMS3 algebra through a two comma minus one beta gamma system, which was worked out in this way. So there's a brief uh, review of that. So. The action for the bosonic beta gamma system is just this, but these uh, the fields beta and gamma satisfies the OP of this sort. 
And if you write, if you expand them in terms of modes, the beta is a spin, uh, spin two field, the gamma is a spin minus one field. If you expand them, then the modes satisfy this sort of a commutation relation. And the stress tensor uh, of this uh, two comma minus one beta gamma system is this, which of course can be expanded in terms of modes. And what was shown is that the modes of this stress tensor along with the modes of the beta gives you a realization of the BMS tree algebra. I've written almost here. That's because there are, uh, uh, this doesn't give you the correct central charges. In order to have correct central charges, you need to twist this operator through some of, uh, with some del cube gamma term. But because central charges will not be important for this talk, I, I haven't discussed. Okay. So we have a realization of BNS3 algebra in terms of this uh, modes of beta and T. So in order to find the differential, uh, the set of differential operators, we use this commutation relation and we introduce these sets of creation, uh, sets of operators, T's and delta T's and T bars and delta T bars and expand the modes of, uh, expand beta and gamma fields in terms of these operators. So once we do that, in terms of these operators, we can we can find the realization of MN and TNs, which are the modes of, uh, which are the uh, generators of BMS3, because we know that uh, these generators are nothing but the modes of stress tensor, and we can write now the now write the stress tensor modes in terms of these differential operators, and this gives us the necessary differential uh, operators that satisfies BMS3 algebra among them. So now that we have these differential operators, we now want to solve them. And we claim that a correlator of this form in the in this CFT, this beta gamma system, will solve these differential equations. Where we have these operators, and I'll define, I'll define them. This bra state is uh, defined through this operator H, and it has this property that acting the differential equate, uh, equation, uh, the differential operators corresponding to super rotation uh, from the left is equal to acting the modes of the stress tensor from the right. And similarly, the super translation operators from the left gives uh, the modes of beta n from the right. Okay. So that's how I'm going to define, uh, I'm going to find an operator H such that these conditions are satisfied. And once I have such a, a, such a brass state, I'll also need to define a G, uh, uh, the ket state. And I define this ket state in such a way that it it is annihilated by the modes of stress tensor and also the modes of this beta phase. Once I, once I have these two, it's, in, it's very easy to see that uh, then such a correlator will, uh, will solve these differential equations. Okay. So uh, for the first step for this, uh, to find this brass state, we propose this following operator, which in terms of the fields can be written in this form, where V and U are just some polynomials and these are uh, the derivatives of beta and gamma fields. And we can just uh, do the math and check that this actually satisfies this property, that acting on, it, acting on this exponential of this operator from the left by, uh, by the super transition and super rotation is same as acting on it uh, from the right by modes of stress tensor or the modes of beta. So that's the first part of it done. And to complete the correlator, all we now need is to find the ket state. And the first condition on the case state is that it is annihilated by the modes of the stress tensor, which tells us that uh, G, this, uh, this case state is nothing but a function of some screening operators. Now, uh, just a quick review that the screening operators are operators with zero conformal dimension, but non-zero charge. And if you have a spin one primary in your system, you can construct these screening operators through this sort of an equation. And you can show that they are they are annihilated by the modes of the stress tensor. Unfortunately, the two comma minus one beta gamma system does not have a straightforward spin one primary. So in order to find such a primary, we fermionize the theory. So you can, you can write down uh, the beta gamma fields in terms, uh, in terms of these, uh, these fields, but phi is a bosonic scalar field and eta and uh, chi are fermionic fields which satisfies uh, this sort of OP among themselves. And then you can expand your beta and gamma fields in terms of these fields. Once you do this sort of expansion, now you have, uh, because, of this, because of the presence of these bosonic scalar fields, you, can now, you now have 
vertex operators. So you can construct spin one vertex operators. And through these vertex operators, you can now define spin operators. So these are the two vertex operators. So there's a background charge uh, for two comma minus one beta gamma system, which, uh, which tells you that these two operators are uh, the uh, conformal dimension one. And through this, uh, you can define these two screening operators. And you can also check that these screening operators also commute with the modes of beta. Okay. And thus the ket state that we have uh, can be a general function of uh, function of these screening operators acting on the vacuum. Okay, so now we have the uh, bra state and the ket state. So you can now just write the partition function. And in terms of our fields, the partition function looks like this. So this is the exponential of uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian operator that we uh, wrote down. And then these are basically just uh, some powers of uh, powers of these screening operators acting on vacuum. And you use uh, this sort of a formula for the exponential operators, and then we write down the partition function. Okay. So what uh, in the final expression, the partition function we write down, this x's and y's are basically some polynomial uh, potential terms, and uh, and these are the van der Mond determinants written here. So what we basically see is that these are there are this is a two matrix model. Uh, one of the matrix models is uh, the eigenvalues of one of the matrix models is given by this x i's, and the eigenvalues of the other one is given by this y i's, and they're interacting through this del squared term in the van der Mond determinant. Okay, so yeah, so this is our result. We find that this is a beta one, beta two matrix model with two values of beta and which interact to the measure of the partition function. And that the loop equations that we have along with some topological regression relations, they constrain the correlators of this matrix model. So our next, uh, under, uh, what I will we'll try to do next is to understand these, these constraints from the side of the gravity. And as I mentioned that uh, there is a lot of work inv involving gravity and writing the 2D, uh, 2D dual of these gravity theories in flat space. So we want to understand how our matrix model is related to this. And uh, a quick note is that uh, in a recent work, Maloney and Witten has started investigating the relation between two plus one D gravity and random ensembles of two D CFT. And we want to understand the connection between our approach and these uh, two D CFT systems. So thank you. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Arinda. Uh, we have time for questions. Please uh, go ahead. Yes, Shovik. Hi. Yeah. So thanks for the nice talk. So, um, so the role of the say the algebra in say the Bursar algebra in a two D CFT, and uh, the role of these uh, constraints which you get uh, in the matrix model. I mean, the role of the algebra is very different in the sense that in the field theory, this is some algebra of some conserved currents, whereas right. in the matrix model, it is these are some constraints for your partition function. That's right. So, um, I mean, since the roles are very different, I mean, uh, do you expect that this partition function which would shed some light on on the field theory? I mean, the, the connection uh, to me yes, was The connection might not be that straightforward, of course, as you said, because these roles are very different. But the point is that both these symmetries play a sort of a similar role in the correlation functions, right? So the, the Virasura algebra, for instance, constrains the correlation functions through word identities and so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and also these loop equations, uh, they also constrain the correlation functions that you get from the matrix model, partition function. So the point is to understand these constraints from, for instance, if you can, if you can interpret these constraints from the gravity side, that's what you get. Yeah, but I would still think that the, uh, in, the, in the field theory, the word identities uh, which we get, I mean, those are like quite different in the sense that- Yeah, of, co of course. You, know, you don't see the central charge. And also since you have the modes of minus one and above only for- the That's right, yes. yes. So the, yeah, so maybe the connection, yeah, is, is yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah. The connection is not straightforward, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably, I mean, since you mentioned the work of Maloney and Witten, I mean, over there, uh, 
I mean, the averaging which was done, uh, that didn't have any direct relations with any matrix model, actually. That is true. Yeah. That is. Yeah, so those theories were rational and it's not like, I mean, there is the random, like since there is some averaging, but I mean, it's, there's no direct relation with, with any matrix model in that case, yeah. That is true, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Your expression for the TN are very complicated because uh, the, that is an artifact of the speci spe specific beta gamma system that you invoke to derive them. I'm right. just wondering, there are some other uh, simpler models in which the MN and the TN can have much simpler expressions, which would, I think, uh, give a better handle on uh, trying to impose a loop equations or something like that. Uh, th th that is an excellent comment. I, uh, that's because I knew the, of this uh, free field realization from the beginning, so I started using it. So yeah, you're right. If there is some other system in which the expressions for, uh, for this uh, super transition and super rotation modes look simpler, it will be easier to implement uh, these loop equations through that system, through that realization. Thank okay, you. thanks. Yeah, just in addition to uh, Shom Dutta's question, probably you can Arindam try with the Liouville, actually. The, the flat limit of Liouville, right? That you know. That right, but the point is that I need a free field realization and free. Liouville theory is not, is not free field, right? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is actually uh, the in the flat limit, you can think of it as a free field realization, right? Oh, yeah, then, then of course, you can use that. Yeah, I mean, we, for BMS, it should not be real, it should be the flat limit of real. Right, right, right. Yeah, in that case, of course, it's well, we can use that to construct this. Uh, or it throw. Hey, Arindam, uh, thank Hi. you for the nice talk. Uh, so, going back to your beta gamma system, uh, right. am I right in saying that? For you, the uh, CL is basically B uh, 26, I guess. And yes. C2 is basically, I mean, it's a, it's a sort of a chiral model. It's a C2, CL, CM equals to zero. Right. So uh, I, I, I think that when CM equals to zero, you can effectively sort of truncate the BMS uh, algebra into one Virasov, right? That is true. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, so I'm just wondering that what exactly then your model uh, i mean yeah, I, yeah. I i understand you you probably did something with it i mean you twisted your uh, stress tensor in a way that's right yeah so the the point is that in order to get the correct central charges all you need to do is you add a uh, operator del, del cube gamma with this stress tensor with some arbitrary coefficient say a and then you will see that that a will appear in the in the op of t and beta so it will give you a central extension there okay okay the point is that when you're writing these uh, if, these things in terms of these differential operators, these central charges don't play any role. In it. So it's basically like a classical version of the BMS3. Okay, so right. both the central charges are set. Sure, right? sure of course. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, 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 so in, in general, uh, so, can I, so, so can I write this beta gamma system as something like a, uh, you know, a chiral half of a conformal field theory, which by constraints have this MNs in, embedded into them. Oh, that's, because, because that's an interesting gamma, question. Yeah. Because these beta gammas are just like, you know, it's like P del X, right? You know. Right, right. So so can I uh, it, it might it might be possible. Uh, yeah. I I because you're saying because of the symmetries, right? Yeah, yes. That's, that's yes. Uh, I, I think I think yeah, it might be possible. Sure. sure. Thank you. Thank you. Just to just to add uh, or it, throw, I mean, it is not it, your BMS is not realized by beta and gamma, right? It is realized by beta and an operator in the beta gamma system, which is T. Right. So the modes, modes, modes of T Z are is basically the T right. ends and the, okay, right. right. Okay. So once so, you get that, then you uh, you basically get uh, BMS completely uh, mm. after that twisting. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, right. TIFR. Hello. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I probably missed, uh, you know, the, the motivation that you, uh, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, so, so now that you have this matrix model, do you have a particular application in mind, something along the lines of, uh, this the Stanford Schenker or something? Uh, so, yeah. So one of the things is, like I said, so, so one of the things we are trying to understand is that if, uh, if we have a, for instance, a. 2D CFT ensemble, like an ensemble of random 2D CFTs, 
if that has any uh, connection i mean those two dcfps has any effective description in terms of in terms of the matrix model that we just described uh-huh. that that is the first thing and the second thing is to understand the uh, constraints on the part uh, the constraints these loop equations which puts a constraint on the correlation functions of the matrix models to understand those constraints uh, in the in the gravity in the 3d gravity so that's that's one of the questions i see okay thank you sure thank you okay arinam i have one question ha ah, sure yeah? okay so uh, you remember in yesterday's tadasi talk he was uh, trying to the, tr- trying to construct the holography for ds3 right the theory right. for holographic to ds3 so in that case he basically started with uh, this partition function uh, with chan simon with ac2 dhp hmm? right But for so so if i want to do the same thing for flat space we know that uh, here right. we do not know like how to get that partition function right but isn't so even if i do not go till your matrix model but mm-hmm. are you not writing a partition function which is bms3 invariant you are right that is true yes i am so uh, so maybe this one can be used and somehow we need to i, I am just missing the the yeah the the point is first of all uh, that part yeah i mean how do you inter- uh, you're saying this is a bms3 invariant partition function true but whether this is a partition function uh, whether this is the same partition function that that takanagi was trying to write no, takanagi was definitely writing no i mean i mean the flat limit of that yeah flat yeah yeah so but the th- i mean what i'm trying to say say is that that somehow that now we have a partition function we, which has which is explicitly bms3 invariant is i think is a new step right i mean we right of course yeah, yes. we, okay, I, I, we will discuss later yes so, sure a, any other question please shom shom dot do you still have questions mm, no i forgot what i was trying yes. to ask oh. oh i'm sorry okay if not then then let's thank arindam again thank you arindam thanks thank uh, so this session ends uh, Olof uh, would you like to uh yeah so uh, i think uh, let's have uh, i think we're now getting used to shorter tea breaks but the good news is we we getting 20 instead of 15 this time so let's reconvene at 4 uh, sharp so we have a 20 minute tea break uh and um i think uh, uh, shankdeep is uh, here yes he is Yeah, hi, so yeah, he's going I'm to be here. chairing uh, the post tea session, Shankdeep, right? Yeah, sure, sure, I'm here. Okay, great. So, so we are continuing with the same link, and uh, so we have a, a pause or tea break or whatever you want to call it for 20 minutes, and we reconvene at four sharp. Okay. Sure. Thanks. Thank you.
Uh, Shankadeep, are you there? Yeah, hi, Alex. Yes, I'm here. Hi, great. So um, we are, uh, I think, uh, uh, Shall we start? start, right? I mean, uh, so maybe uh, you could ask the first speaker to uh, share uh, their slide and stuff. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yeah, so a big yeah. So a big welcome uh, to this session of uh, ISM twenty one. So we have the first speaker, Mangesh. Mangesh, could you please share the screen? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is visible, right? Yes. Yes, it's visible. Mm -hmm. So, so the Mangesh will speak about tensionless tails, critical dimension, and spectra. So over to Mangesh. So Mangesh, uh, you have thirty minutes. So I'll give a reminder after twenty five minutes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sankar. Uh, thank you, the uh, thanks to the organizers. Uh, so uh, the uh, meat of this talk will be based on uh, uh, my recent work with Arjun Bhatia and uh, Puneet Sharma, and uh, 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 some ongoing work as well. I'll introduce there. Um, so before I get to the meat of the talk, I will uh, give some introduction to the tensorless thing, uh, their uh, 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 classical description and uh, how they are quantized as well. So uh, uh, let me follow the convention of uh, uh, starting the introduction to the tensorless string by this statement. Uh, uh, string theory is, a, uh, is the most viable of current theories of quantum gravity. Uh, so the string theory is characterized by uh, uh, a scale called uh, string tension, as we all know. The uh, uh, so it has uh, two natural limits. So one limit is the tensionless similar limit, which is uh, studied very extensively. It's the point particle limit, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, discussed in terms of uh, the field therapy uh, uh, description of uh, string theory. But the other limit that was uh, first introduced by Schwarz and then uh, uh, extensively worked on by Gross and Mende uh, in the seminal paper. Uh, in the in these uh, uh, in this work, uh, Gross and Mendes show that uh, in the in the tensionless limit that is alpha prime goes to infinity, uh, 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 the string scattering amplitudes have uh, an infinite number of uh, uh, relations with each other, and uh, uh, this reveals a, a huge symmetry, a huge hidden symmetry of the string theory. So uh, from the world tree point of view, this tensorless limit can be assured by uh, taking the uh, ultra relativistic limit. So uh, basically the tensorless limit takes a form, uh, tensorless string takes a form of a long floppy string. And uh, this also means that uh, 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 you take uh, the limit, uh, tau goes to epsilon tau and epsilon goes to zero where uh, tau and sigma are the world tree coordinates. And uh, then it is like uh, giving an infinite boost. So this is, uh, 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 ultra relativistic limit when it's seen from the uh, world sheet of uh, world sheet point of view. So uh, in this limit, uh, the world sheet uh, conformal algebra becomes a Galilean conformal algebra, which is also, uh, also isomorphic to BMS. Uh, the tensionless limit is related to hydrodon physics because in uh, uh, at the hydrodon temperature, the uh, effective spin tension goes to zero. So emergence of a long string indicates a phase transition into uh, new fundamental degrees of freedom at high energy, which is uh, 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 illustrated in, uh, uh, which is rather introduced uh, to uh, in uh, this paper. Uh, so first, uh, uh, let me uh, come to the uh, classical picture of the tensionless string theory. So. Uh, the tensionless limit uh, uh, can't be nicely taken uh, with the poly, uh, starting with the poly action. So uh, Isberg et al. in this paper uh, have uh, uh, proposed uh, or rather showed a new way of taking uh, the tensionless limit. Basically, in this limit, the worksheet metric becomes uh, degenerate. So uh, since the uh, only non-zero rank below two is one. Uh, uh, this uh, uh, wall sheet metric can be written in terms of this uh, uh, vector, uh, wall sheet vector V. And uh, 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 like its uh, tensile brethren, this uh, uh, tensionless action also has a 
quality tree parameterization uh, symmetry, which is a gauge symmetry. So this symmetry can be fixed by choosing a gauge where uh, the tau component of V is a constant while the sigma component uh, is zero. Then this ILS action boils down to uh, the form in equation five, where X dot is the uh, derivative with respect to tau and X prime is uh, derivative with, uh, with, respect to, with respect to sigma. So uh, uh, now uh, with this action, you have to also impose uh, the gauge fixing constraints which are basically the vanishing of the stress tensor component. And these are given in equation six. Uh, the variation of equation five gives the equation of motion, uh, which is x double dot is equal to zero. And it has a simple solution, basically x is uh, some f sigma plus tau d sigma. So uh, if you look at uh, equation uh, of motion seven and the constraints uh, uh, equation six, then what it tells you is classically the tensorless string is a string of massless particles moving at the speed of light orthogonal to the spin. So that is a classical system. Uh, and the two pi periodicity in sigma allows us to write uh, this solution in terms of these modes in the sigma direction, basically, uh, namely these a n and b n in equation nine. Uh, this x zero, uh, okay. This small x is the uh, center of mass position of the string, and center of mass momentum is related to the mode, uh, the zero mode b not uh, uh, by equation ten, and the uh, gauge fixing constraints in equation six, they can be written as equation eleven in uh, in terms of these modes. Like. Uh, very similar to the tensile case, this uh, tensile-less uh, string uh, action also, even after this uh, gauge uh, fixing, has a residual gauge symmetry, which is given in equation 12. So uh, the generators of this uh, this gauge symmetry are these uh, LNs and MNs, given in equation 13. And these equations, while in tens uh, sorry, these uh, generators, while in tensile case, the generators form the Pirasaro cross Pirasaro algebra. Here, it, uh, here they uh, satisfy the BMS algebra, which is given in equation 14. So let's, uh, okay, so far, uh, any questions? Because this is just the introductory stuff. All right. So let me uh, uh, go to the quantization of these. Uh, yeah. Uh, let me go to the quantization uh, of these uh, uh, tensile things. So uh, uh, you start with the fundamental uh, commutation relation between X and T. And since you have X in terms of these uh, oscillators, and likewise, you can write P in terms of these oscillators, in terms of these modes, A and B you can write the commutation relations between A and B. And these are uh, uh, given in equation 15. So now these uh, modes in quantum picture are, propo uh, are promoted to something called oscillators. These oscillators uh, act on uh, the Hilbert space. And uh, the physical uh, states are a subset of this Hilbert space, which uh, 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 have to satisfy now the uh, uh, gate fixing conditions that were uh, uh, that were uh, introduced to uh, introduced earlier in what we call a sandwich form. So this is given uh, in equation 16. So these A and B are uh, constants that are the normal order uh, normal ordering constant because uh, uh, as uh, shown earlier. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Fine. So uh, these LNs and MNs are uh, okay. So as shown in equation 17, these LNs and MNs are uh, quadratic in A and B. So uh, 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 you have to introduce a normal ordering constant where there is a question of uh, normal ordering, and that uh, 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 these uh, appear when uh, you have L naught and N naught constant. So again, these constraints also satisfy the BMS algebra, but now a possible, with a possible central extension. 
And now for quotation, you have to impose these conditions. As I said, these are the sandwich conditions. But the sandwich conditions can be implemented in three different ways. For example, uh, consider the LM condition. So what you can do is the LM right action on a physical state is zero for all n, all non-zero n, or it is zero for only uh, n greater than zero, or it is never zero but it is only zero in the uh, when sandwiched between two physical states. And similarly, for uh, you uh, you can impose uh, these constraints uh, in the MN constraints also you can impose in the similar way. So uh, in total there are uh, three to three nine possible ways of uh, uh, imposing both the LN and MN constraints. But luckily for us, only three out of these nine ways are consistent and non-trivial. So these three ways uh, 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 result into three, dis uh, dis uh, three distinct uh, uh, vacua and uh, three corresponding uh, ten tensionless string series. And the normal ordering constants A, B, as well as the central extensions depend on the choice of the vacuum because the normal ordering themselves depend on the choice of the vacuum as we will uh, come to uh, after this. So now, uh, what are these three vacua that I uh, told you about? First one is the induced vacuum. So uh, in the induced vacuum, you impose the LN and MN conditions as in equation 19. So the LN conditions are only uh, satisfied as sandwich, while MN conditions uh, are satisfied as a right action for all N not equal to zero. Uh, and this induced vacuum, when you uh, look at, uh, uh, you can uh, look at this induced vacuum uh, uh, by taking a tensionless or uh, uh, by taking a non relative uh, sorry ultra relativistic limit of the tensile vacuum as well so when you take uh, the uh, tensile string vacuum and take its ultra relativistic limit it naturally gives you the induced vacuum and uh, uh, this uh, vacuum is characterized by some interesting physics like the both sense and condition uh, condensation of all the tensile space and emergence of open string as well, uh, which is uh, uh, done in this paper. The second of the vacuum is the flip vacuum in which the uh, LN and MN constants are implemented in the highest weight uh, fashion. So uh, the right actions of LN and MN are zero for uh, all the N greater than zero. And now the flip uh, vacuum can also be obtained by uh, uh, ultra relativistic limit, but not of the usual string theory. It's the ultra relativistic limit of the uh, uh, string theory, uh, uh, usual tensile string theory with an automorphism where the uh, uh, the uh, uh, anti holomorphic uh, sector is quote fixed, uh, quote flipped, un uh, unquote. And uh, the last one of this bunch is the uh, oscillator vacuum. So in the, uh, uh, the basically the oscillator vacuum, uh, uh, none of the uh, uh, conditions are implemented as a right action, but they are only uh, satisfied in the sandwich way. And yeah, uh, I'll uh, uh, come let uh, come to this later how this can be uh, achieved. Uh, so this oscillator vacuum is not obtained by any limit of tensile strength. So this is a truly intrinsically a uh, truly intrinsic uh, uh, tensile vacuum. And now our work uh, uh, has uh, attempted to obtain the critical number of dimensions uh, in which the tensionless string theory in each vacuum is valid. So uh, again, any questions so far on this? Okay, so uh, these are basically three uh, tensionless corners of the tensile photonic flow string theory. I have a question. Yeah. So, what is the kind of spectrum uh, of these theories? Yes, yes, yes. I'll, I'll uh, come to the spectrum. Actually, spectrum is the thing that we are working on currently. We have some interesting results, but uh, yeah, uh, some corners haven't been trusted. But yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about those as well briefly. So, okay. stay tuned. Yeah, so should I go ahead? 
Yeah, yeah, no, yes, please. Okay, so now uh, let's uh, 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 come to the quest of uh, uh, finding out critical dimension. So how am I doing uh, uh, in the time department? Yeah, so you have, so you have 15 minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, now uh, let's uh, come to the meat of the talk, which is uh, uh, finding out the uh, critical dimensions uh, vacuum by vacuum. So uh, first for this, we uh, implement the uh, light cone gauge. Uh, so uh, as uh, uh, mentioned earlier, there is a residual gas symmetry and this residual gas symmetry can be fixed to a uh, bit by choosing tower sigma so that uh, uh, a tau is basically the x plus coordinate with some uh, constant of course. And uh, so this is uh, given uh, in equation 22, where x plus minus are uh, linear combinations of the time, uh, uh, the space time, time, and one of the special di directions. And uh, all other directions are denoted by xi, where i runs from 1 to d minus 2. So yes, d is the number of space time dimension. And these are called the uh, uh, transverse directions. It's similar to what we did in the light cone condition of the uh, uh, tensile chain. So this thing that amounts to uh, choosing the a plus and b plus non zero modes to zero. Uh, non zero index mode to zero rather. So that's the equation 23. And now uh, we had the constant equations. So the constant equations were quadratic in uh, uh, A and B. So those were not easy to solve. But now what happens is uh, since the equation 23 is there, these constants can actually be solved for A minus and B minus mode. So what it tells you is that the A minus and B minus modes are uh, basically the dependent modes, while the AI, BI modes are the transverse modes, are the are transverse oscillators, are the truly independent oscillators. Okay. So the next thing is uh, now the uh, uh, for finding out the critical dimensions, we uh, demand that the Poincaré algebra has to be satisfied in each vacuum. Uh, and the uh, reason is this, because uh, uh, the light cone gauge is basically this uh, weird gauge in which the tau is fixed to be in some light cone direction. So this actually breaks the explicit Poincaré symmetry. And since it breaks the Poincaré symmetry, you have to consider the Poincaré generators one by one. And what uh, we can see is that the boost generator, J i minus, these boost generators can take you out of this case. And for that, you have to compensate, uh, uh, you have to uh, uh, do a compensating gauge transformation. And that introduces a lot of non-linearity in the equations. And it's not very clear that uh, 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 these uh, uh, compensating gauge transformations actually uh, 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 help with the satisfaction of uh, this uh, Poincaré algebra. And if we look closely, it turns out that uh, this particular uh, 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 element of the algebra, j i minus j j minus, this is not always zero. Uh, according to the Poincaré algebra, it has to be zero, but it is not always zero uh, in all vacua for an, any arbitrary number of space and uh, dimensions. So what we do is vacuum by vacuum, we find out uh, the J minus, uh, 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 the expressions for these uh, Poincaré algebra generators. And then uh, 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 these expressions are in terms of basically all these oscillator uh, and uh, zero modes that we are in the expansion of uh, 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 yeah, uh, in the expansion of X and P. And uh, uh, then we take uh, these commutations in terms of these uh, A and B oscillators. And this is 
kind of a very 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 uh, cumbersome algebra especially in the flip uh, it it is especially cumbersome in the flipped and uh, uh, oscillator vacuum but still that has been worked in our paper and uh, uh, this uh, the uh, the result of all this uh, uh, neck breaking algebra is uh, 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 it gives you the critical number of space time dimensions for each vacuum so first of all question. okay yeah so um, this this is this is akin to the light gone gauge quantization in tensile strings right yeah so uh, i mean in order to simplify things why don't you why have been, why haven't people tried the brst quantization approach a uh, brst quantization yes uh, uh as far as uh I know. I mean, uh, I worked out and I discussed with people. Uh, the thing is, uh, the uh, in uh, actually in the tensorless case, one thing helps is that the uh, holomorphic and anti-holomorphic sectors are separate. They are not mixed, so you can uh, uh, find out all of these. For example. Uh, uh what do you call it ops and all very easily these are very nice expressions and that helps a lot uh, to my understanding the problem here is that uh, unless we consider uh, some uh, uh chiral sector we can't actually uh, uh, because in this uh, the uh, holomorphic and anti holomorphic sector uh, actually mix up so the Uh, expressions as far as okay i have worked out that they are kind of ugly and people also have told me that it doesn't work that way so that that's what i understand about this issue for now so i don't know if arjun or shankar or anybody uh, wants to give a better explanation for this um hello <laughs> hi hi uh since i <laughs> since mm, mm, uh, mangesh uh said so so people have in the past attempted to do the uh, i mean brst as well and um yeah i mean i think uh, it should be on the list of our i mean to do things uh, uh what what people have not done in i mean in the past i guess is they have they do not have an understanding that there were three separate uh i mean three 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 separate vacuo that we are speaking about so it's it's a good good thing to ask and i think it is it's is very high on our list of things things to do and since the underlying algebra will will change and since the underlying things will 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 actually change um there will be more i mean it it i'm i'm not sure it's 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 a very simple analysis to do so that's that's my short take on this but i mean thanks for 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 asking this this is a good question okay thanks okay thanks yeah so uh so vacuum by vacuum we see the uh, uh whether the uh, how the point are and whether it's satisfied so first in the induced vacuum uh, uh, the constraints can be uh, constraints uh give uh basically equation 26 that uh needs to be satisfied uh, by the vacuum so basically the vacuum has to be annihilated by all the non zero b mode so uh here this is the simplest of the vacuum in this analysis it doesn't have any uh, non zero central charge or the uh, uh normal ordering constant and uh, the algebra turns out to close in any number of dimensions here so there is no critical dimension for this particular vacuum but things change when we consider the uh, flip vacuum so the constants are implemented and the uh, vacuum is demanded to satisfy uh, the equation 29 basically all the positive uh, uh, modes for a and b have to analyze this vacuum and uh, uh, now uh, this uh, 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 now when we analyze uh, the closure of poincare algebra here the uh, since the central charges and uh, the uh, uh, normal ordering constants don't uh, vanish here 
uh, it gives a particular relation that has to be satisfied by the critical dimensions and uh, uh, this relation uh, can be solved to give d is equal to 26. So the critical number of dimensions for the flip vacuum is 26. And similarly for oscillator vacuum, uh, since the uh, uh, constraints are kind of vacuum, we have to introduce a new set of oscillators, uh, namely C and C tilde, which are the analogs of the uh, tensile alpha and alpha tilde oscillators. Uh, they uh, have the similar commutation relationship. And uh, uh, here also uh, the non-trivial uh, uh, central charges and uh, normal order constants uh, give a constraint uh, that is only satisfied as uh, d is equal to 26. So here also the uh, number of physical dimensions is 26. So yeah, in the uh, remaining time, I'll just uh, give quick remarks on the steps as uh, uh, was uh, asked for earlier. So uh, in the tensile strings, we know that these alpha alpha tilde form of uh, Fox test uh, 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 for the uh, uh, state, which can be then implemented with constants and that gives you the physical state. So it's a, uh, a somewhat similar story, not exactly, but somewhat similar story for the flip vacuum and the oscillator vacuum as well. So the, the state here also takes the form of the Fox test, but the induced vacuum has a different story altogether. Uh, uh, because uh, one way you can see this is that uh, induced vacuum as I told you earlier is uh, done by taking uh, a tensileless or uh, the uh, ultra relativistic ultra relativistic limit of the tensile vacuum and uh, when you uh, take the similar limit of the tensile spectrum then all the states actually form a both Einstein condensation so it might seem that there are no uh, perturbative states uh, uh, that can be formed on uh, the uh, induced vacuum I but, guess, uh, you have five minutes yeah. oh yeah i'm almost done yeah, uh, but uh, uh, when you consider now, uh, let's get back to the classical picture of the uh, tensile string. So this is, uh, as I told you earlier, this is a string of passive particles going their own way. So uh, this picture is preserved by the constraints uh, that are imposed in the uh, tens uh, in the uh, induced vacuum case, uh, although not in the other vacuum, but uh, in, uh, in particular in the induced vacuum. These constraints are uh, uh, these constraints uh, are complementary. Uh, these constraints rather preserve this picture, and so you can uh, quantize the tensile strings like they are formed by uh, massless particles, and uh, this allows us to construct the non-perturbative states, uh, which uh, take a form of this exponential I L uh, I L M states, and these states, if you look these actually were already introduced uh, by uh, Kabbalene et al. in this paper uh, uh, in, uh, in the language of the unitary induced representation of the BMS algebra. So this is a nice uh, thing that uh, this is a rather a surprise that these things are also uh, visible, these non perturbative states. And uh, okay, so, uh, let me summarize uh, the talk. So uh, the requirement of closure of Poincaré algebra was used to evaluate uh, the critical number of dimensions in all the three vacua of the tensile string. And uh, uh, the out of the three, uh, the flip and the uh, oscillator vacua were found out to uh, only survive in uh, the, uh, the number of dimensions 26 while the induced vacuum uh, could exist in any number of test and dimensions. Uh, this indicates that the theories arising from all the three tensionless vacua form a consistent subsector of the tensile string theory. And uh, the spectrum work is going on, so stay tuned for that. So yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay. Thanks, Mongi. So a couple of quick questions. Yeah. Okay, so I see uh, Alok. Alok is there. Hi, Mangesh. So the Hi. as you were saying that in one of the quantization you get quantized bosonic ambit twister string, right? As you were showing in the yeah 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 triangle yeah. corner the the flip the flip flip, uh, yeah. flip yeah. 
So, but we know empty twisted string, we know that it's chiral, right? So one thing, I mean, this is related to the earlier question where we were discussing. I think there we know that uh, BRST quantization of empty twisted string. So at least mm -hmm. in that in that vacuum, it is yeah, possible. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, basically the thing is that the, uh, okay, so I haven't given the expressions of the central charges here, but when the central charge, uh, one of the central charges, basically the, LM commutator central charge, uh, which is called CM, when that uh, central charge is zero, you can actually restrict uh, to a chiral sector. So uh, this can be done in the uh, uh, in this vacuum as well, uh, the flip vacuum. So yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. you can do that. So, sorry, can I, uh, uh, Shango, can I ask one more? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. yeah, no, I mean, also the central charge issue, as you are saying, so I thought that in the ambitwister case, we know that the you know the central charge for the GCA comes from the Virasoro central charge, right? So uh, it's twenty six. I mean, for the um, and, and that's consistent with what you are showing here also. But yeah. we don't have to do the light cone gauge analysis. I was saying. I mean, once you know that they are equivalent, as we know the ambitwister quantized ambitwister in this for one vacuum with the your null string. I mean, this tensionless string quantum theory. Yeah. So there we know, I mean, even we know the spectrum, right? I mean, we know it's only finite number of massless states like in MBT state. I, mm -hmm. I was just wondering so that at least for that choice of vacuum, we know a lot more, I guess, right? Or, or is there something that uh, uh, we, we are missing there? Where you have yeah. the flip vacuum, yeah. When uh, yeah, so you know, this is, yeah, this is, uh, right. Uh, uh, this is a, Actually, the bosonic version of uh, the bosonic MB twister, yeah, exactly, yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So, but I'm saying that that one has been studied in detail. I mean, so we know that the spectrum and we know that that the GCA gets a central extension. So, at least for that vacuum, we know like mm. some of the things that. Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a general question. Yeah, it. Yeah, that might work actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah, uh, if if I might. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. 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 Yeah. So 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 yes, you are. I mean, you are absolutely right. You know. So so this is sort of like a. I mean, sort of. <laughs> I mean, sanity check at the end of the day. That I mean, what we are doing is fine. And okay. Okay. Yeah. So 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 you know, just just I mean, re redoing this in the same same way, and you know, going going through through the algebra at the end of the day, you end up with something, that mm. that uh, you know. That I mean agrees with. I mean, what is there in the literature? But I just okay. wanted to also just point out. I mean, one one thing that it, it may seem a little, uh, you know, I mean, seem a little uh, uh, trivial that we do all of this analysis and get to I mean, d equal to uh, uh, twenty six, and that's 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 what happens. And everybody's like, yeah, whatever. I mean, d equal to uh, twenty six is what you expected, right? At at, at the start. Just uh, wanted to emphasize that. It's probably, I mean, not as trivial as that in the sense it's a very singular limit that you take on on the string. I mean, I mean, on the string world sheet, and uh, you know, a lot of things can go wrong. But it's uh, so. No, no, absolutely, I just yeah. yeah, I just said that even in MB twist it was not trivial, but. Uh, but yeah, as you're saying yeah, that that, that's, that's, that's right. that so, for that vacuum we know that it's, it's uh, yeah that is that is right yeah, so if yeah. you if you i mean accept the fact that uh, you know the <laughs> i mean truncation of, of of the algebra down 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 to the sort of works yeah, then yeah it, that, that that would be a straightforward way of seeing it but this is sort of like a i mean just a, uh, i mean sanity check that things mm -hmm. are going in the right way okay thank you thanks yeah, sure sure please yeah so the next the tif work uh, hi, Mangesh, and, and very nice talk. Yeah. Uh, just to continue on the last question and the one before that, um, because you've got a tensionless string, um, it seems to me that either you're going to get only massless particles or you get particles of all mass, like a continuum of masses. Yeah. Right? So, uh, uh, so uh, uh, Alok explained to us that one of the vacua has only massless particles. Mm -hmm. Is that... Um, is that what you expect from the second vacuum as well, or do you expect a continuum? Uh, in the flip, actually, we have massless, but uh, this thing, actually, uh, the induced vacuum, uh, uh, this is something that we are a uh, sort of troubled with because uh, till now, what we have worked, we, uh, 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 from this uh, string of massless particle picture, we also get some uh, massive state. So, 
uh, and this is a continuum basically this is a momentum continuum so this is a mass continuum as well sorry so in the induced so in your talk did you say that you had no states in the induced vacuum yeah, yeah no no perturbative states of course but there are no, non perturbative states I, I see and, and so you find a continuum and that's what you would expect from the induced vacuum right because the full spectrum of string theory collapses down to a continuum if alpha prime goes to zero uh, yeah, that, that's what hey, alpha prime goes to infinity. Sorry, at, yeah. at least that's what the algebra gives. But the uh, problem is that uh, when we check with the literature, the induced spectrum, as I uh, uh, mentioned uh, here as well, the induced spectrum uh, uh, that has been in the literature is of this form, uh, the e raised to i l, and these states can be shown to be massless. So somehow, just the massless uh, spec, uh, the uh, massless subsector of what we have been finding as uh, a, a general uh, set of uh, states, only this has been found in the literature. So these new things, I don't know whether these are uh, somehow unphysical uh, with some consideration we haven't taken, or as you said, these might be there and uh, uh, be a part of a mass, uh, a mass state continuum. So yeah, till now, Exactly. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, can I just butt in here? I mean, I'm, I, I would like just like to you know reinforce what Siraj was saying. The, 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 the continuum, the mass continuum that you get in the alpha prime tends to infinite limit is basically the induced vacuum itself. When you look at this induced vacuum, you will find that you know this is this all of the all of the uh, states in the tensile uh, string theory has actually collapsed on this only one state, and this is like some sort of a long string state where all of these information is encoded. This, 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 this state that Mangas is showing here, uh, this cannot, you, you cannot really get it from any alpha prime going to infinity limit from the tensile spectra. This is a new feature. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so, so yeah, so let's thanks Mangesh. Uh, so we have the next speaker, Aritro. And uh, he is going to speak about uh, tension steles, uh, Rindler wrote to Carolian wall sheets. Okay, let me. So, Aritra, yeah, please share, let me share my screen. Ooh, um, screen. Is, is this visible? Yeah. And uh, is my. So, cursor... you have 30 minutes, so 25 uh, for presentation and 5 minutes for discussion. So, I'll okay. give you a reminder. Is, is, my, is my cursor visible? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, uh, so, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, the organizers, uh, for, for inviting me to give this talk. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mangesh, actually, for giving very nice introduction to this. Uh, whenever I try to talk about these things, it seems that the introduction takes all of the time and actual meat of these things were, uh, are never... <laughs> never addressed. So this is something that we have been uh, talking about uh, for last couple of years, and these are the these are the papers th that are that these are based on uh, something that we wrote last year and something and we recently sort of started to understand it more or you know that's a misnomer. I mean we started to get confused more about this and we wrote something else recently. So yeah, so this is what uh, I'm gonna talk about. Uh, so. As Mangesh was, uh, you know, they're telling you guys that distensionless or null strings, they, they, they can be thought of as fundamental objects as you are showing you this null action or, or some sort of uh, limit on the, on the, on the tensile uh, wall sheet theory. And it seems it, 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 it happens to be that these, these, uh, these uh, uh, limit of this, uh, of the, of the theory is a Carolian limit on, uh, on the wall sheet. What I mean by Carolian is the wall sheet speed of light actually goes to zero as opposed to the, uh, the non-relativistic limit or the Newtonian limit of the usual theory. So, uh, so there are two ways to look at this uh, theory uh, in, in, in this case. So uh, what I would be telling you about is a bit more wacky than that. And I will be telling you that uh, the, these limits can all, all also be interpreted as some infinitely accelerated world sheet limit. Uh, so uh, this tension going to zero limit actually corresponds to some sort of infinite uh, linear acceleration. And when you go to the, 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 the infinite limit there, that also generates BMS3 as the 
వాళ్ళ షెడ్ డ్రెస్సింగ్ టోల్స్ ఏమో చేయాల్సి చెప్పడా నా ఆర్ యు టు కెన్ గో టు ద ఫుల్ స్క్రీన్ మోడ్ యా ఐ కెన్ గో టు ద ఫుల్ స్క్రీన్ మోడ్ బట్ సమ్ హౌ ఐ కెన్ నాట్ హ్యాండిల్ సమ్ హౌ మై జస్ట్ ఎ సెకండ్ మై జూమ్ ఇస్ డూయింగ్ సంథింగ్ వియర్డ్ లెట్ మీ జస్ట్ యా సో ఓకే ఆ సారీ how do i uh, get rid of the zoom window uh, okay cannot seem to get rid of the zoom window ah, okay is this fine uh with the, with full screen yeah yeah it's fine okay nice so yeah as i was tell, uh, telling you guys so th- these 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 null strings are generated by uh, this uh, infinite worksheet boost limit where you effectively take sigma going to sigma and tau going to epsilon tau and where this epsilon actually goes to zero uh, it, so 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 uh, what what uh, again again uh, i will i will actually uh, violate causality and sometimes uh, refer to mangesh's talk if you are tuning in just now i'm so sorry uh, so the tensionless oscillators uh, that 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 mangesh was also talking about the c's and c tilde they needed to be some sort of combinations of a and and b so that you can put them into the oscillator form you know usual tensile string oscillator form if you wish what mangesh did not tell you that if you go from the limiting perspective uh, in the carolian limit you can actually imply a relation between these ans and bns which actually appeared in the tension less string uh, mode expansion they are related to the alphas and alpha tildes in the tensile string in 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 certain way so w- once you have that and you know that the wolschit metric actually degenerates at the strict epsilon equals to zero limit and the riemannian structure stop stop making sense and you have to inherently do something carolian to to make sense out of the theory you can actually proceed what you can see is that uh as again uh quantizing these null strings they require uh, a consistent choice of vacua you have different vacua you have to uh, impose your constraints and that that actually uh, defines your theory uh now for 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 uh, for convenience i have written the mode expansions like this form uh where the c's and c tilde does appear in, instead of these a's and b's that mangesh was telling you about uh and the oscillator representation of the vacua is particularly uh, like the high straight uh, vacua of the uh high straight high straight vacua of the uh tensile theory but in terms of the c's and c tilde now what is very interesting question. yeah so uh, these oscillators when you're talking about oscillators you, you usually think of them as oscillating in time uh-huh. There, there's no time dependence in the exponent there's just sigma So in True. what sense are they oscillators they they are oscillators in terms of canonical conditional relations so for example this a's and b's that mangesh was talking about these are like these were like x's and p's and the cns and cn tildes are certain combinations of them so that they are like your uh, annihilation and creation, you know a couple of annihilation and creation operators yeah they are creation and annihilation operators i agree but in what uh, what i'm trying to what i'm confused about is in what sense are uh, is it legitimate to call them oscillators it, maybe it's just semantics or uh, yeah i mean modern... yeah yeah by by all means i mean it's a uh, we, we can we can call them something else but uh, i i when i say oscillator i am just talking about the, you know this this just the algebra i mean the, for, I mean of course I understand your question that you know but but as you can see from this mode expansion a tau going to uh, something at a, ta- a small tau limit has been taken on this oscillator so that the tau dependent oscillator the tau dependent exponential is gone yeah okay right? yeah so what what is new uh, that if you if you if you uh, take these uh, earlier definitions of c's and if you put in those definitions of a's and b's in terms of these the epsilons uh, you find something very very interesting that the uh, tensionless oscillators c's they are related to the original tensile oscillators in in a, in a nice way 
and you can actually write this this transformation in terms of some Bogolyov transformation where the Bogolyov uh, the Bogolyov coefficients cos a theta and sin a theta are given by these epsilon dependent factors and it turns out that uh, the, these remain Bogolyov transformations uh, in the in the in the whole flow starting from uh, the tensile theories to the tensionless theories basically if you put epsilon equals to 1 where where there was no no boost to start with of course you you you, you get back alphas and alpha tildes in the in between when when the boost was finite of course nothing changes because boost does not actually until the infinite case uh, boost actually doesn't change the system only at epsilon equals to 1 things change and new things appear so so this this so, so you, now you can see that there is some sort of interpolating uh, uh, definition uh, around here which is more than just a boost it seems that uh, there is some sort of uh, physics of acceleration going on somewhere which is giving me this sort of structure when I actually go to the epsilon going to zero limit where, where uh, singular things appear. So that actually uh, uh, made, made us think that, uh, that, that there must be something, this zero alpha to zero C, which we call, I mean, like the tensile to tensionless vacuum. This suggests that there is a flow, flow which is more than a booster system. And this explicitly appears in this UR contraction or the uh, Carolian limit. Uh, because of because the modes when when you do the con uh, Wigner contraction of the generators the modes uh, in that actually mix with each other uh, the ends and minus n mixes and that's why that's why the, this this uh, this uh, Bogolyov transformations appear now uh, if you people do and uh, the non relativistic contraction as well but in the non relativistic contraction there is no such mixing so 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 although classically both of them actually lead to the same brackets because of the uh, isomorphism between two dimensional GCA and BMS three but they are physically very different objects. Now, since uh, we were thinking about whether, whether acceleration can also produce some, 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 some null, null theories on the world sheet. So uh, recently we found out that, uh, that uh, if, you, if you have uh, strings, world sheets near, near horizons, then they can also be, uh, also be uh, seen to be uh, becoming tensionless. So actually a near horizon limit on a black hole is basically a Carolian limit. So this is a work by Laura and the collaborators. So, they, so basically what they did, they showed that the C going to zero limit actually corresponds to going near the horizon in some uh, particular parameterization of the metric called the Randers path through formalism. Uh, but uh, since, since, since there is already a Carolian object present in the, in the, uh, in the background, so, so you can actually think about uh, induced metrics on, on, on closed strings and near, let's say a short shell black hole horizon. And uh, taking and taking uh, uh, you know a, a, a near horizon limit on the world sheet uh, with some you know tortoise coordinates, some some mumbo jumbo there. What you find out is that uh, when you put everything back into the uh, Polyakov action, uh, the 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 action uh, tells you that the uh, tension has scaled uh, and it has scaled with this exponential of R C factor in this box. <clears throat> Or this RC going to minus infinity actually is the near horizon limit. So when 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 the 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 world sheet actually moves very close to the horizon, the string also becomes tensionless. So what 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 we understood from this that since near horizon limit on the black hole is a Carolian limit, and the Carolian limit on the background is a Carolian limit uh, on the world sheet as well, because the tensionless limit itself was a relativistic or a Carolian limit. This actually settles a very important uh, question because. Uh, there has been this uh, idea that uh, a Carroll string, uh, the uh, one with a Carroll, which is moving in a Carroll background, and a string with a Carroll world sheet, uh, something which is inherently Carroll on the world sheet, they are different things. But uh, our claim is that when, once you have a Carrollian background, you inherently have a Carrollian string as well. So, since this works, uh, uh, the next step was to, since of course black holes are hard things to uh, work with, uh, we thought uh, since uh, you know near horizon of black hole can be locally replaced by some Rindler space, why don't we start to try to see what what happens if I have a string on the Rindler uh, on on a, on a explicitly Rindler space as well? Now uh, bear in mind that uh, this this realization came in 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 two steps. In 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 our first paper we talked about only world sheet which had some in, inherent Rindler structure but in this in, in, in the recent paper we have some understanding of it from a Rindler uh, target space uh, uh, point of view as well just to remind you this this was the how the Rindler 
uh, uh, how the Rindler coordinates work. You had your Rindler times, which were these 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 lines here, these eta one, eta two, eta three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And of course, you had uh, your, your 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 particles would move in this hyperbolas uh, given by some 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 coordinate xi, and you had right wedges and left wedges and whatnot. So a nice thing to see here is that the Rindler horizons are at uh, let's say. Uh, in this metric here, uh, the, the metric that I have written, uh, the Rindler horizon sit at x0 going to infinity and x1 going to minus infinity, et cetera. Uh, if you look at some induced metric in, in the closed string induced metric in this background, what you'll find is that, uh, the, that this, this, this actually uh, uh, keeps a conformal gauge on the world sheet invariant, but we, th th there is a factor sitting out on, on outside, which is like e to the power two x1, which actually goes to zero when when you go near the horizon. So the whole world sheet actually degenerates, which is uh, one of the telltale signs of uh, uh, of a null string appearing in the in the theory. So uh, what we uh, what we decoded out of this that the uh, background Rindler structure actually induces some sort of a world sheet Rindler structure. Of course, world sheet coordinates are you know you could say that you know I can do some more, uh, wild transformation and make it. Uh, flat as well, but when you are near the horizon where 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 your conformal factor actually goes to zero, then 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 you cannot really do that. So null strings actually would emerge when the horizon is hit in some some way, uh, and also this uh -huh. would. Yep. So uh, in the previous talk, I understood that uh, in this uh, tensionless limit, the world sheet action reduces to x mu dot x mu dot. Is that yes. correct? Yes, in one. So now, that is you're, now you're saying that the entire uh, world sheet action degenerates. In what sense is yeah, are so those two? Okay, okay, that's a very good question. So, so the so um, as you as you were uh, seeing in the other talk that uh, the the dot dot square survives. Now uh, the problem the 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 problem with uh, uh, this uh, this formalism is that it does not really care about when or or how the, your metric actually degenerated uh, you could have both g tau tau and g sigma sigma going to zero uh, or you could have the g tau tau going to zero and th that would not really matter but uh, uh, in in any case uh, if you have a null null uh, induced metric structure then you could al always do this formalism now that I would say that is a bit of a cheating on my part that I I I, I am not exactly uh, talking about a Carolian structure where you would actually have this this the g the the g tau tau part uh, that 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 would remain and the sorry that that would go away, uh, but it seems that since again it's a two, two two dimensional thing for example when when I was talking about this induced metric near the near horizon. You would, you, would, you, would, you would see that you know at r equals to 2m the induced metric basically vanishes but uh, you, you, you can you can you can still talk about null strings at, at, at that point of time is but this is just a, another way of looking at it I'm not saying that you know this is the like, you know, exactly same way so what exactly do you mean by null strings I mean uh, when I say null strings I mean that uh, the wall sheet metric of the string at every point on the wall sheet has degenerated. But that would mean that the action goes to zero. What? The, why, why wouldn't that mean that the action goes to zero? The, the action goes to zero. Yeah, if, if the if the world sheet matrix degenerates, what do you mean by degenerates? Determinant of G going to zero. That's why that's why you cannot write the metric the yeah. the the action as root minus g g alpha beta del alpha x del beta x anymore. Yeah. So if if the if the determinant goes to zero. Yes, that's why that's why, a... exactly exactly that's why you would have to do this other formalism that Mangesh talked about. That's the LST formalism where you uh, change you you in, instead of this g alpha betas you have these uh, one forms uh, that you put in into your action and write down so that 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 actually encodes that null structure. That's even how there, even mm -hmm. there. Uh... It's basically the Weierbein formalism, right? You're going from the metric formalism to the Weierbein formalism in, in some sense, right? Mm -hmm. So even there, you would have the determinant of the Weierbeins. Yeah, you would so have. Why, so if the determinant of the metric goes to zero, the determinant of the Weierbeins would also go to zero in one sense. I mean, not... So I, even, I, even, I, in, even in that formalism also, I suppose the 
thing would degenerate in the same sense as the previous one yes has. but then as i was as 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 i was telling you that these wheel binds are not the uh, not the wheel binds that you know these are carolian wheel binds where you cannot really do the up and down because the metric has degenerated sorry i i think uh, we need to move on and uh, just a small comment that so i think it's better to uh, interpret it in terms of the vector density right i mean right uh, i mean yeah that's that and, that and the particular choice of these gates sorry uh, so yeah it takes that form this x dot square right but in general you can you can have any two component vector density that that would give you an null, null metric as well right hmm. I can I can tell you uh, sorry the I I'm I, I can I can talk about this in the the discussion session discussion mm -hmm. more if you want okay okay so yeah as I was telling you so 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 the 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 idea of this embedding is that uh, in anywhere where you uh, you 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 have you have put in the the put this thing in in some sort of accelerated background uh, due to this uh, embedding there would be null points which will exi exist on the world sheet. Where the metric has degenerated uh, because of because of this uh, the, the particular nature of this embedding. So uh, now, what do I mean by a Rindler world sheet? Uh, because of course, you know, I have been talking about Rindler background, but what do I mean by Rindler world sheet is a is a bit more uh, involved. So how we interpret a Rindler world sheet is 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 a generalization of a uh, of a Rindler uh, world line, which is basically a hyperboloid. Now instead of uh, doing to, to get these strings, you, usually you do the constant time slices instead of uh, usual tau sli time slices. You will have eta eta time slices, uh, the Rindler time slices basically. So these hyperboloids, as you as you move towards the um, more and more accelerated region, the the throat of the hyperboloid will start to close, and you will get just something like a null cone. That's how we interpret uh, the features of a Rindler world sheet. And the good thing about this is. As you increase your eta, as you go towards the null lines, the the hyper the the constant time slices actually to start to start to become elongated, and at the end you just have the null line. So basically, just a one one null line. Uh, so this is our picture of the Rindler world sheet. Now it 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 comes from that 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 you know when when I try to talk about uh, these strings in a Rindler background itself. You can you it start it 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 it, it come it it it, it uh, implies basically that from going to go from an inertial and a non inertial world sheet, which is you know inertial world sheet is things that we know, and non inertial world sheet was just what the photo the, the pictures that I was showing you. They they need to have some sort of a map between these two, and it turns out that these there are there are these maps the, the sigma and tau going to xi and eta maps, and which are basically singular at certain points. And this actually marks the special points on a Rindler world sheet where uh, the, the induced metric has degenerated and has to be taken care of very, uh, very uh, um, carefully. Uh, this is, but this is not something new. I mean, you, you, have a, you have a string where there are particular points where the uh, world sheet embedding has, world sheet embedding has, in, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it is not valid anymore. And these are particular null points. The, this is not in new, this is like a folded string, which, inter, which, is, which uh, is there in the literature. For example, in the ADS case, you have these GKP strings where uh, strings are they, they are they are folded at certain points and uh, in a sense they could be thought of as open strings uh, bound together by closed string, closed string uh, boundary conditions. So uh, in our interpretation we could think of these accelerated closed strings as some sort of open string segments. Uh, I mean there could be more than one segment of course I mean more than two segments of course and these are glued by some sort of boundary conditions which which still make them uh, closed but you know in a you know, under under quotations. So 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 so, if that works. Sorry, I have been going on. I mean, I I don't. I hope people have. Do do, do people have questions? Sorry. Okay. I think then. We have nine minutes. So. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay, okay. Then I should I should I should really. Fly. So, uh, as I was telling you, so once once you you can you can have that. So. Uh, so you have you, you, you so, so you, you could have so so what what I uh, showed you this map is basically in, in the what you would call in the flat 
uh, in, the, in, the, in the flat space case as the uh, maps on the right Rindler wedge, and the uh, and the there will be other maps with the uh, minus signs, which you will call the uh, left Rindler wedge. What they mean, I'll come to that. But for now, let's 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 just think that you know you had some non-inertial world sheet, and as long as I'm not hitting the horizon, I am in a finite acceleration phase. My symmetry generators will be will be changed. I mean, it's very easy to find those. Uh, generators and it it turns out that uh, these still at finite a uh, will 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 give you uh, the classical part of the Virasov algebra or the Witt algebra if you please and as I was telling you since there are two maps on the world sheet that you can do seems that there will be uh, another class of the uh, world sheets where where you would have uh, some other uh, some 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 other uh, generators of the Virasov algebra, but they are related to each other by these these flipped uh, flipped transformations where this n goes to minus n. So this is what basically is sort of an analytical continuation between the right wedge of the Rindler string to the left wedge of the Rindler string because you know you you can see that the 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 direction of the time like killing vector actually changes. So once you have that, uh, you can also talk about what happens at the acceleration going to infinity limit. Uh, now, of course, uh, this is all bullshit point of view, and you could see that there are two ways to take this limit. In the one case, you could uh, you could just uh, combine uh, objects from the right wedge, and in the other case, you can combine objects from the both right and left wedge. It turns out that in the first case, it is like an BMS or, like, or, or the you know conformal Carolian sort sort of algebra, and the other case. Uh, it is the Galilean conformal algebra, but both of them are classically the same. So you would say that you know at the acceleration density infinity limit, I still have the BMS algebra. Now, what this all means is in terms of this uh, nice uh, geometric picture, which uh, I hope to. Uh, so, so basically, as I was telling you, these these Rindler world sheet can be thought up about some sort of hyperbola, right? Where you have uh, the 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 closed strings, quote unquote closed strings, they are basically constant eta, uh, constant uh, time, constant linear time slices of, of your original world or of, of, of this hyperbolite. And if you if you I don't know if you can look, uh, see the picture whole. So I, I have drawn like two different slices of the of the of this hyperboloidal world sheet. Uh, one along let's say some eta direction and some minus eta direction. So what happens is that if you look at the the, the right linear wedge and the, so the right linear map and the left linear map, uh, they can only cover either this green red segment of this of this of this uh, uh, picture or the or the blue uh, yellow segment of this picture. So that actually gives you a sense of right string and a left string. So these these are all uh, the, the 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 quote unquote closed string will be sitting on the constant eta surface, but you will have a a particular string which you will call you know, which, which which will be like the right uh, right modes of the of the Rindler scalar or uh, and the left modes of the Rindler scalar. And these two ways to combine the string to make it a whole closed string sort of that actually uh, would correspond to the two ways to construct the algebra that I was showing you. And they are all connected at this these points, which are these special points, null points, or the folding point. Ah, excuse me. So uh, if you have that, you can you can go ahead and try to quantize it, and you will find out that since since we are talking about two disconnected segments, uh, now the vacua is basically some sort of uh, direct product of this right and left vacua. Uh, but since the since the since you can still write you can still write. Uh, string modes which which are valid over the whole thing but of course these beta n's and beta l's they don't really talk to each other because they sit on uh, causally discrete segments and uh, you sorry sorry so you have five minutes including question and answer so oh uh, um, okay I was, can i can i have like two three more minutes okay okay yeah. okay, okay so this you this is so sorry i'm uh, no no yeah. problem yeah please please go ahead yeah. so this those this, this un modes are these are positive eigen modes and uh so the question is that likewise in the case of uh, Rindler uh, scalar fields in Rindler, how would you define your uh, uh, your global modes? And it, it turns out that it's uh, once you understand that that green red you know this right what is the right Rindler string and what is the left Rindler string, uh, doing that is, uh, is is analogous to the usual usual uh, uh, scalar field case. And you can you can analytically extend the modes and define globally uh, well defined ones. And you can check the orthonormality and all sorts of things and write down modex functions. What this does is that it lets you write uh, these vocally of transformations between tensile strings and these beta r and beta l oscillators that I have been talking about. 
And in the limit, when you take the acceleration going to infinity, you will find that these are connected to each other via this map that the epsilon goes like one by a, uh, that is to say highly accelerated strings and highly boosted strings, they converge to become the same sort of null string. Uh, again, uh, I think, uh, so, okay. Uh, the other thing is that if you try to talk about what, 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 uh, the, the, the glued, gluing, gluing conditions or the boundary conditions that actually keep them together, you find that, uh, the, 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 the state that, that, the on which, uh, that, that I would, uh, I'll talk about when, when, when I try to glue these states is basically something like a coherent state of these betas and beta tildes. And in the acceleration going to infinity limit, you just have a boundary state along all directions. And that is what you basically get from null strings who are in the, in, 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 in the extreme, in extreme boost limit. So what, 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 what this all tells us that, uh, that the appearance, uh, so, so since we have this boundary set and we, we have been calling the inter, uh, interpreting this as a long open string in our earlier papers. So what, what we have that we have a way to uh, talk about uh, uh, world sheet Unru effect, which is like, you know, basically folded string, uh, folding of the strings. And these casually discounted segments, they couple it together uh, uh, in the accelerator string Hamiltonian. Uh, why do I keep calling them closed? Because they are, you know, uh, one of them, of course, they are, uh, you can call them like closed entangled objects. Uh, and these level matching conditions on the, on, on, on these for connected, this, this connected wall sheet actually remain invariant throughout this flow of acceleration. But I, I don't have much time. I think I should end. I mean, this is something that I've been trying to talk about, but let's not do that. Uh, what, what I was uh, now, whatever I was telling you about are the, are like Rindler strings. These are not real black hole horizons. So we should be careful about what we, what we call a horizon and what, what we would not. Uh, the, the right thing to do would be have inherent Carroll structures, Carroll target spaces, and couple Carroll background, Carroll, Carroll wall sheet to it directly to see how, how these, these things work. And of course, uh, since I, I got these entangled uh, uh, strings, uh, left, right entangled strings, so it, it would be nice to have an idea what they actually mean. Uh, also uh, about Hegedon tran transitions, it seems that, that there are uh, kind of connected uh, objects that, that have uh, appeared in, let's say, this has kind of lump picture. Uh, but of course, it's not clear how to get, let's say, the Hegedon tr temperature in our picture. Ah, sorry. Sorry, I think I, uh, I I don't want to say anymore. I, I yeah, that's all. Yeah, thanks, Aritu. So, uh, questions? <sighs> yeah, I think the last part was too fast. Okay, uh, Shamdatta has a question. Yeah, please. Yeah, so these uh, strings. Um, so, so when ordin so are you saying that when ordinary strings approach the black hole horizon, they become uh -huh. Carolian strings or something like yes, that? Yes, that's, that, that's the idea. That when you have when you have uh, a Carolian background, that actually induces a Carolian structure on the on, on a string ball sheet. And that's okay. because of the because of the metric in the because of the space time metric in the world sheet action because of the space the the the, 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 embed the, space time. the embedding yeah. of the space time. yes yes yeah so okay. which which is also probably i i i'm not i'm not i i don't know but people who do like holographic qgp and stuff i think they also deal with uh strings where horizons are induced from from background and these things heat up basically so of course, I mean, those are probably probe strings on open strings, but yeah, something similar. So can you kind of uh, envisage a sort of stringy hair on black hole horizons? Oh, I, 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 yeah, I, 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 I'm not, I'm not qualified enough to make a comment on this. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so there is a question from ICTS. Yeah. So yeah, uh, ICTS raised hand. So I am audible. Yeah, you're audible. 
Hi, like, was there a similar story about like when I when I study strings in like uh, say flat space time, mm-hmm. say in an appropriate dimension, would I would I, like would it induce some BMS structure on the string? On a flat space time dimension, on on a flat space time. Yeah, on asym. I, I'm studying studying strings on asymptotic flat space times, and the okay. Okay. have the BMS structure, but that doesn't usual. There's no usual story of that inducing something similar on the world sheet, right? Hmm. Okay. Uh. So 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 I basically take my string to sky plus or something like that. Is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, I thought. Yeah, I thought that was the idea here, right here. But since it was a horizon, so near horizon, it had some Carolian symmetry. Uh huh. Say that that kind of uh gives so many properties. That kind of induces these properties onto the world sheet theory, right? Um, yeah, and uh, Carolian symmetry of the space time inducing Carolian symmetry on the world sheet. I'm true. asking a similar paradigm, like should I expect something similar for BMS symmetries of the asymptote here? Like, so basically, I mean, yeah, okay, okay, I understand. Uh, Can I jump in? Can I jump in? Uh, I think uh, I think the BMS symmetries are not inherent in the metric, which is what. Uh, did the thing for the Carolian string. So the BMS symmetry. No, that 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 actually does not work in the same way. So uh, I mean, I, I I guess the point is that if you were to think of the about about the whole thing in as as strings propagating only on scry plus or I mean scry minus with uh, you know the null 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 direction being being uh, being your, your time direction, we would expect the same thing to happen. there as well so yes i mean if you have a string on a null null surface if you have a strings uh, propagating in in you know a null null background you'd expect that similar things are are i mean induced on the world sheet as well but it's not strings propagating in flat space right it's it's strings propagating on scry plus if you wish so so you are you are you are talking about the sort of metric uh, which uh, laura had in her uh, talk uh, the the full metric in the asymptotically yeah uh, yeah i mean if you if you think about the metric on scry plus it's z- uh, 0 times du right mm-hmm. I, i mean 0 times du square plus rest so it's it, i mean you know if if that is what you take as your space time then then yes the same 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 things at least i would expect that they would go through uh, okay is there any other question from icts because i see the hand is still raised i just just confirming so why, why is uh, like in any closed string propagating near the bound uh, near the scryplus would would have these properties so why why do i not have to discuss these when i naively discuss string scattering amplitudes or something that's a good good question which i do not have an answer to <laughs> i mean i i think we yeah that's um yeah i mean i i, I guess we we don't we don't uh, we don't necessarily uh, look at yeah i mean asymptotic symmetries when we are discussing scattering of strings at the end right i mean i don't know how to pose the uh, question actually if somebody uh Uh, more, more. I mean, somebody more, more, more qualified should actually uh, try and phrase phrase this for us. Uh, but I mean, as I'm, what I'm trying to say is that if you were to think about, uh, you know, uh, scry plus essentially as the space time in which you should actually uh, propagate your strings, then similar structures should show up there as well. i mean it's not propagating in flat space it's propagating on the null 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 boundary of flat space basically uh, arjun can i just say, say something so yeah please please uh, please yeah no i mean in the, in the for at least one of the quantizations that we were discussing that the null string gives you the ambit twister string and for the ambit twister string amplitude we know bms is present because uh, you, know, you you have what identities which give you the soft theorems in the ambit twister yeah. string amplitude mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. So, so that kind of confirms the. I mean, this the answer. I would think the answer to the previous question is yes. That I mean, 
that there may yeah, be yeah, some... yeah that's 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 a good, i mean that's a good point yeah i mean uh, that's 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 true actually yeah yeah for the mb2 case i i guess it's true because of because of the uh, i think mb2 thing is much more well studied but uh, the uh, my only problem is that the quantization that we are talking about here it's not not the mb2 stir quantization it's uh, yeah, it's yes, a, yes, that is true. more like I mean, a yeah. thermo but close yeah, to hope, try because there's a possibility you could right. yeah hopefully the same same things similar things would show up essentially as as, as, lo- as long as you can write a target space metric in terms of uh, a generic carol metric i think uh, this this is this this goes through and but yeah i mean i i think the question regarding why we do not think about uh, uh you know string scattering and uh, why don't these structures show up there is don't people uh, talk about string scattering around sky plus because i i thought that that's what i mean alok can probably yes uh, so he's saying that one of those things yeah yeah I mean, uh, right Okay, hello? maybe. Oh, hello. I, yeah, I, maybe we can postpone to yeah, yeah, yeah. the discussion yeah. session. So, on this. Next. hello. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Yes. So, like, uh, I, I, from what I understood from all, all, what Alok said, it's just recovering the usual BMS and the usual software and kind of stuff from st- string scattering amplitudes, right? From the ambit twister, I mean, which is not, uh, yeah. which is kind of singular limit of the tensile string. I mean, it has only finite number of master states, but. For those amplitude string amplitude, we do see men BMS. Uh, this is yeah. the flat space soft theorem kind of amp. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's true. This, they, yeah. The point of these what these cases are doing is that like you have to carefully take a limit, deform limit in the on the world sheet and so on to see this. Yeah. This, so, so so there also the BMS is on the world. I mean the the symmetry is acting on the amplitude twister world sheet. Uh, uh, right. I mean the. Yes. you have the vortex operators on the world sheet uh, there which implement this super rotation and super translation right these charges are defined on yeah, the yeah yeah yes 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 so but you don't have to do some very careful care, uh, world sheet analysis with the scaling and so on to see it yeah, well i mean that, that's a point that you yeah you you i mean if you do mb twister then it's already there and if you go from null string perspective at least there is one quantization as mangesh was discussing which gives you mb twister Exactly. So yeah. So what what happens is in in the in in that case uh, you you take the full I mean the BMS three actually reduces to just just one, I mean one 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 half of a CFT, mm-hmm. and then uh, you know try trying to understand vertex operators and things like that are 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 uh, I and mean, that's that's I mean just the usual stuff, right? But for the rest of them, it is not because the whole I mean whole structure is there, and one needs to do more work, and hopefully. Similar things show up as well. Yeah, I think I, we 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 really postponed uh, the uh, other discussions uh, for the discussion session. So thank you, Aditya. We have the next speaker, uh, uh, Kushal Chakraborty. So Kushal, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yeah, okay, so please share your screen. Yeah. yeah and uh, and uh, so Kushal will be speaking about large and not invariants. So over to Kushal. Uh, okay. So uh, can you see my screen? Yes. we can see and let me just add plus to that okay so yeah hello everyone so i am kushal and uh, first i would like to thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present my work in this platform so yeah i will be talking about uh, large and not invariant which is um, based on our recent work uh, which has uh, anchored that so uh, let's start yeah so let's start with the definitions of what is a knot and link so a knot is basically an embedding of s1 into three dimensional euclidean space r3 or the three sphere s3 but in general one can consider a uh, more complicated manifold and one can embed a knot on this uh, circle s1 on the that manifold So here is a typical example of a knot, and the link is basically uh, made up with uh, several component of knot which do not intersect each other but can have some uh, um, link between them. So those are called link. So now the thing is that uh, if you can deform one knot into another uh, without cutting it, then we call those two knot to be equivalent. So uh, in order to distinguish between a uh, different knot. actually what people did is uh, will uh, define some uh, mathematical quantity which are called uh, not invariant 
and uh, they has the property that so if you calculate a not invariant on two different not and if they are different then we can say that those two knots are definitely not same i mean are, those are equivalent, inequivalent not but the converse is not true so uh, actually the um, defining a code uh, not invariant is a challenging problem but it turns out that uh, chantham theory can give an answer to that uh, problem so uh, so, um, so we know that uh, the observable in chantham theory uh, the wilson loop so the wilson loop are basically the holonomy calculated on a knot. So here, these are the gauge field, which placed in representation R, and the holonomy of this gauge field calculated over a, over a knot. And the vacuum expected value of this um, Wilson loop are topological. So being topological, I mean, it turns out that this uh, vacuum expectation value of a Wilson loop are a good candidate for this knot invariant. So there are several uh, not invariants. So for example, if you consider this uh, SU2 gauge theory, Janssen theory with SU2 gauge group, and if you put a uh, Wilson loop in fundamental representation, then the uh, vacuum expectation value will give you the Jones polynomial, which is a not invariant. And if for SU N gauge group and with uh, Wilson loop in fundamental representation, it gives rise to this uh, home fly PT polynomial. Uh, for SU N and with uh, fundamental representation, this gives rise to uh, Kopman polynomial. But in general, uh, Janssen's theory provides a wide uh, class of uh, these uh, not invariant by simply putting uh, any arbitrary representation on this uh, Wilson loop, and those we call the colored polynomials. So, uh, if you start with a complicated knot, then uh, you can uh, decompose that knot in by using the skin relation in terms of unknot. So, skin relation basically untie the knot, uh, untie the crossing between them. And you can just decompose any complicated knot in terms of unknot, but it turns out that um, other than fundamental representation based on the knot, the using the, the use of these conditions is very difficult. And also there is a although there is a very uh, vast literature in physics and mathematics where uh, people have calculated this knot invariant for um, a different class of knot with uh, some simple representation other than fundamental. But still, uh, calculating a uh, not invariant for any arbitrary representation is still a challenging problem. So, in this paper, in this talk, uh, what I will talk about is uh, I will show you how to calculate this uh, not invariant for some some class of knot and link with arbitrary representation placed on it in the large n limit by using the Sarel point technique. So, what we did in our work is we first calculated the uh, not invariant for hoplink. So this is a picture of a hoplink. So this hoplink is basically made up with uh, two one knot. So the one, this uh, each of them are single one knot, and and they have some crossing between them. And we have put some representation R one and R two on this. They can be in general arbitrary, and we have calculated this um, vacuum expectation value of this hoplink in the large limit. And later we use uh, those result to calculate the uh, not invariant for um, some class of knot and uh, link in the large n limit. So here is a plan of my talk. So first I will uh, show you how to calculate this uh, hoplink, the vacuum expectation value of hoplink in large n limit, and then followed by some example of it where I will put some representation on it. And, okay. and later I will use uh, this result to calculate the uh, knot invariant for other types of knot and link from this hop link. And later, if time permit, I will discuss about the uh, large gen phase structure of this knot invariant, or in particular, large gen phase structure of correlation functions of Janssen theory. Okay. So let's start with hop link. So uh, one can use the surgery technique and show that uh, in the large gen, okay, so one can show that. so. This uh, the hoplink expectation value on this manifold, which is basically a three mod z piece of this type of manifold. Um, the hoplink expectation value has this form. So if we put p equals to one, then we'll get the uh, hoplink on in S three. Okay, so here S and T are uh, modular transformation matrix. So S is uh, corresponding to inversion, and T corresponds to this translation. And all the representation here involves are uh, called uh, integrable representation. 
Okay, so these are the expression for S and T, and this C2 is basically the quadratic classification on a representation R. So one can think of this um, integral representation in terms of Young tableau uh, with uh, no more than a k number of columns and no more than n number of rows. So here uh, this is a Young tableau with L1 into number of box, okay. and these are the hook number. Okay. So everything here is written in terms of uh, this uh, hook hook length. Okay, and uh, so this sum is over all uh, integrable representation. So for our calculation purpose, uh, we have defined a, a new variable theta in terms of this hi. And for integrable representation, so this theta are ranges from uh, minus pi to plus pi. So now by uh, using this uh, variable theta, if I just uh, just replace h uh, by theta over this on this expression. So one can see that the ratio of this modular transformation matrix is R R1 divided by S0 R1. Okay, so zero corresponds to a trivial representation. So that means in terms of Young tableau, so there is no box, zero number of box. Okay. So the, this ratio can be written in this way. And so this the, uh, okay, so this form uh, is uh, exactly same as uh, the character of uh, UN group at representation R. And where we have written the character about which um, the character is calculated, the matrix, which in this form. So where the eigenvalues of this matrix depend on this representation R1 placed on it. So again, uh, for our calculation purpose, uh, we have defined a, a rescaled hop link, which is basically the ratio of um, hop link expression value to the, uh, the modular transformation matrix S0, R1, and 0, R2. And uh, so this, uh, the expectation value of um, this uh, uh, rescaled hop link is of uh, this form. So, okay, so here, these, these are the characters at the presentation half of this matrix uh, UR1, and C2R is the uh, quadratic Casimir. Uh, yes, any questions? Uh, okay. Okay, and so A is uh, given in this way. So this is uh, and lambda, lambda this A is depend on lambda, and lambda is n by n plus k, where k is the uh, the level of my Janssen theory, and n is the uh, rank of my this uh, gauge group. So here we have considered a uh, UN gauge group. Okay, and so and this sum is of our uh, integrable representation. Okay. So this this uh, function, the, uh, this form actually um, looks same as uh, the partition function of uh, 2D Young theory on a cylinder with a boundary holonomy matrix U of R1 and U of R2. So on the cylinder, the, the two boundary of the cylinder, you have this uh, boundary holonomy, holonomy matrix U of R1 and U of R2. So, but the only difference of this, uh, this form and the Young, uh, the partition functions of Young Mills theory is that for Young Mills theory, you have sum over all representation, but here I have sum over all the integral representation. So Gross and Masses Singh, uh, they have studied the partition functions of uh, young mills theory on a cylinder, and we basically followed their you know, procedure. So, so without uh, going to the calculation details, so let me show you the key point. So, uh, so uh, in the large end limit, one can, yes. Uh, so in the large end limit, uh, one can uh, uh, write that this uh, vacuum expectation value of this hop link is given by this form, which is e to the power n square s. S is some function and which depends on this sigma one, sigma two. Okay, so this sigma one and sigma two are my uh, density of uh, these um, two holonomy matrices, eigenvalue density of two holonomy matrices. Or uh, to be more efficient, yes? Hi, Kushal, there is a question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So, can you... so in the large end limit, the summation over all the integrable representation is the same as summation over all representations, right? We don't uh, really need to distinguish integrable representations from. Uh, uh, no, actually, what we did is uh, so uh, we just regulate that sum. So, yes, if, of course, if we put uh, n goes to infinity and k goes to infinity, then this sum over all, all the just integrable representation coincide with all representation. But we have considered so n goes to infinity, k goes to infinity, such, but this lambda, which is n by n plus k, this is finite. So we sort of regulate that sum. I see. Yeah. 
yeah, and we have uh, calculated everything uh, in this scenario. Okay. So, any other question? Okay. Yeah, not now. So, please. Okay. Yeah. Proceed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so okay, so yeah, so I was talking about so this sigma one and sigma two. So this density one can think of is as the young tableau density of uh, representation R one and R two, which were placed on my hop link. And uh, so this sigma has an upper cutoff, which is one over two pi lambda. So this sigma cannot uh, cross this uh, upper bound. So this function is which satis this satisfies uh, this uh, equation. And this equation is uh, similar to the uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation with action S. And so, by the studying, okay, so studying this Hamilton Jacobi equation is basically the same as uh, studying this uh, Hamiltonian. So, this is the uh, Hamiltonian, okay, this is the collective field theory Hamiltonian. Uh, uh, okay. This is a free Hamiltonian also. So, again, yeah, the studying this uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation is same as uh, the studying the equation of uh, the Hamilton's equation of this Hamiltonian. So these are the Hamilton's equation. So one can, so this first equation is the uh, same as uh, the continuity equation of a one dimensional fluid uh, moving on a, a link with uh, density sigma and uh, velocity V. And the second equation, okay, so V is given in this form. Okay, and the second equation is uh, the universe stroke equation. So we want to solve this equation uh, with uh, in presence of this boundary condition where the fluid, I mean, this one dimensional fluid evolving from uh, this uh, density sigma one to this density sigma two within time a. And in the large chain limit, the, uh, the uh, leading contribution to this uh, hop link expectation value is uh, this form. So this is the, uh, so this, this, the, this bar is the action evaluated on these solutions. And this is my action is, okay. So in the large limit, so these are uh, that this um, the dominant contributions of this uh, hop link will be completely governed by this equation. So one can calculate, I um, mean, in this the same way, the vacuum expectation value of unknot by uh, simply putting one of the representation of the hop link to be trivial. So, yeah. so if here, so let's say if you put this representation R2 to be trivial. So then, I mean, this ring, you can think this ring vanishes, but basically this is a unknot with representation R1 on it. And so now for unknot, okay, for a trivial representation, so this is the density profile of trivial representation. So to, uh, to find the uh, yeah, unknot expectation value, one is to again solve uh, these equations with the boundary condition where sigma one will be the um, density of the representation uh, R1 is placed on the unknown and sigma 2 will have this profile. So, yeah, so let's uh, consider an example of it. Okay, so for simplicity, we have uh, considered, um, okay, we have put two representation on this hop link to be the same. So, both so, uh, sorry, uh, just one small question. So, yeah. you have exact solution uh, for this Hamilton's equation. Uh, okay, so for this equation? Yeah. Uh, no, actually, these are. Uh, Finding the exact exact solution, I mean, find, you mean the general solutions, right? Right. Uh, okay. So yeah, for these two boundary condition, we have uh, exact solutions. Okay. For some of for some of the some of the cases, some particular cases, let's say. Uh, okay. So okay, let's consider this example. So for this kind of density, we have the uh, exact. Uh, you can solve those two equations. Okay. Okay. And uh, so, okay. Yeah, so, okay. So, okay, so if we consider the density of to be this this form, which is the semicircular distribution, so then, uh, uh, and we have uh, cal calculated the density. Okay, the, we have solved that equation, and later we have uh, calculated this uh, this S bar on this solution, and in the large end limit, so this uh, the hop link expectation value has this uh, following form where this W R1 R2 is given by this way. So, yeah. so in general, I mean, this kind of, uh, okay, in the, in the, this kind of uh, polynomial is basically it's a two variable polynomial, which depends on this Q and S, where Q is equal to the power two pi I by N plus K. But as we are in large chain limit, I mean, the large chain large scale limit, so this, uh, this quantity is basically one. 
and we got everything in terms of this lambda but lambda is basically uh, this s is e to the power 2 pi i lambda and lambda is n by n plus k so uh, so now uh, now that we know the vacuum expectation value of uh, hop link and unknown we can use those results to find uh, other types of um, uh, not infinite for other types of knot and link. So let's consider here. I have a I have considered a link which is a two component link. It's made up with uh, two knot. One is the blue one and another is the red one. And they have uh, here they have these four crossings. And one can put the representation R one let's say uh, on this blue line and let's say the representation R two on this red line. And this can be in principle arbitrary. Okay. And okay. So using the surgery technique one can easily one can get uh, a two component the okay the, the expression for a two component uh, link with a two number of crossing by this following way so let's uh, consider a manifold which contain two are not one is with representation r1 and another is is with representation r2 and you cut those manifold along s2 such that i mean this uh, this uh, by this way of cutting, it, it, inter it divides each knot, each unknot into two parts. And then uh, we can um, use this uh, operator B on these two central strands. So the role of this operator B is it will just introduce a right handed half twist on these two central strands. And uh, by applying this B 2M times, one will get uh, this kind of a blading. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So after this, I mean, one has to just glue this two manifold back, and one will end up with a two-component uh, link with a two m number of crossing. So yeah. So Ramadevi, Kovid Rajan, and Call they have uh, found an uh, not invariant for uh, this kind of, okay, for uh, this kind of link in terms of. Um, eigenvalues of this grid matrix B. So this lambda plus is eigenvalues of this grid matrix B, and which is basically a function of the quadratic assembly of the representation. And here, uh, RS is basically the, uh, the irreducible representation one can get from the tensor product uh, decomposition of the representation R1 and R2. So this R1 and R2 are placed on my coupling. And this sum is over all this uh, representation RS. So we can just take this, uh, take the part which do not depend on this sum outside this sum. So here I have taken the RS independent part outside and written the rest of the term here. So in the large n limit, we can again um, convert this sum into an integral by using this uh, variable theta. And here's one thing to note that, I mean, this, okay, so this was the uh, sum converted into integral. And here the, uh, the, con the uh, this in integral is done over only those configurations which one will get from the tensor product decompositions of R1 and R2. Okay. And now uh, one can see that, so this integral has the following property, which is basically f of m comma lambda is basically f of one comma lambda by m. Okay. And for m equals to one, uh, so this, uh, this link is basically a hop link. So up to this, yeah. And uh, so using this property, one can write the not invariant for those kind of link in the large end limit in terms of the, uh, these are uh, not invariant of uh, hop link. So this is the hop, not invariant of hop link or the vacuum expectation value of hop link. So, so let's uh, go to a um, different case where I have only considered a not of this kind, so this kind of knot again one can get uh, by using the surgery technique, and for this time one has to put uh, both. I mean both the representation on these two strand to be the same, and by and then again by uh, uh, this by the surgery technique, and after that uh, applying this uh, braid metric B M times. So if uh, here M is odd, and then again if I one glue, so then they will end up with uh, this kind of knot. So basically, torus not are of this kind. So for uh, M equals sorry, to one. Uh, sorry to interrupt. You have nine minutes, including question and answer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, I will just wrap up quickly. Okay. So for M equals to one, the one uh, the okay, this knot will be unknot, and for M equals to three, so this is the profile, 
And again, uh, Ramadevi and others also given an expression for uh, not invariant of this kind of knot uh, in terms of uh, eigenvalues of this grade metric. And using the same uh, argument as before, one can write the not invariant of this kind of knot in terms of uh, not invariant of unlink. So this is the, okay, not invariant of unknot. So this is the unknot uh, expectation value. So, okay, so let me uh, go to the third part of my talk. So, uh, so as I have uh, mentioned before, so this is the uh, vacuum expectation value of hop link on a manifold. So, okay, and the in the large limit, the, this uh, the behavior of uh, this um, expectation value is governed by uh, two um, so, uh, the, by the by the two uh, fluid equations. So now let's see so how a typical solutions of those fluid equations look like. So let's say so this this uh, this uh, yellow line is my uh, density sigma one, and this uh, green line is my density sigma two, and this uh, blue line is basically the solutions of those fluid equations. And so at uh, okay, one can see so at time t equals to zero, it coincides with uh, this uh, sigma density sigma one, and as time progresses, it spread over. Uh, it just spread and after some time it starts to contract and end up with sigma two. So basically the fluid is um, spreading over the circle and again it's basically contracting. So let's call the time T star when, okay, let's say T star is the time when this fluid has its maximum spreading. And if this time T star is between zero to A, then one can prove that. So this sum will be dominated by a single representation R. And the young tableau density of uh, that single representation will be inverse function of the fluid calculate of the fluid density calculated at this time t when it's spread maximum. So let's say this is the density of the fluid at its maximum spreading, and this is the young tableau density of the dominant representation. And these are basically the inverse function of each other. And now, the, depending on this. Uh, density sigma one and sigma two, or uh, more generally depending on this uh, representation R1 and R2, this uh, dominant young tableau density can have four type of phase structure. So here I have given the four type of phase structure. So like I mentioned before, the sigma star has an upper, cut, upper cap, so it cannot exceed this value. Similarly, this um, row y, so row y is the density, young tableau density, this also has an upper cap, it cannot exceed this value one. So when a uh, sigma star has sigma star theta has uh, this kind of profile when where it has a gap over its support and it do not touches this gap, so the uh, young tab dominant young tab density will also has will not touch the gap and also has a gap over its support. But one thing to note that whenever this uh, sigma star is spread over all of its support, then uh, the dominant young tab density will develop a gap here and vice versa. And so here, when this sigma star is spread all over all of its support and also has a gap, so the dominant young tableau density will also have a gap and, uh, and it also will spread over all of its support. Okay, so let me summarize my talk. So first I have uh, calculated, the, I've shown you how to calculate the knot invariant for hop link and unknot in the large limit and followed by an example. And later I have showed you how to use this result to find the knot invariant for um, other class of knot and link in the large end limit. And in the third part, I have showed you the phase structure of these coalition functions of transformation theory in the large end limit. Okay, although here I have discussed everything for a uh, UN gauge group, but, uh, one can, uh, but one can do the similar type of computation and, uh, and one will get the same result for SPN gauge group also. Okay, yeah, so yeah. thank you. Thank you, Kushal. Uh, so now it's a time to have some question and answer. So, yeah. there are any quick questions? Okay, so there is uh, from some yeah. question. Yeah. So it is M dependent, right? The results which you're going to get is. Yeah, it is, it is M dependent. And also, there is a P dependence. Uh, T dependence. P, P on the S3 mod ZP. Okay, yeah. So I have absorbed, absorbed that P into my uh, this A. So yeah, it, it, it will depend on A. I mean, 
Yeah, it will. Uh, so this A is depend on P and lambda, and uh, thus these solutions will depend on my A. So in principle, it will depend on P also. Yeah, yeah, you can see here. So it here it has an explicit P dependence also. For other complicated non-torus knots, you don't have any idea, right? Uh, no, actually, uh, so right now we don't have any idea, but yeah, we are uh, we don't know how to generalize these things for other complicated knot. Maybe uh, if we can calculate the Janssen theory with a higher correlation function, so like uh, loop with a more more knot in in them, then we can calculate the higher. Uh, like Borromean ring, people would have done, right? Uh, okay, uh, excuse me. Borromean ring, which is the generalization of the Hopf link for a three component. Okay, yeah. So those we do have a closed form expression. Maybe you should try with R one, R two, R three for the Wilson loops. Yeah, actually, um, so we 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 are planning to gen I mean generalize this result for uh, more uh, yeah more component of yeah this uh, this type of loop. But yeah, right now uh, we don't have any idea. I'm so, done. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 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 I think Shondeep has a question. So please go ahead. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Kushal, for a very nice talk. You know, I know nothing about the subject, so I apologize for asking this very elementary question. Uh, but you map the problem very beautifully to solutions of a Navier Stokes equation. Yeah. Um, but the Navier Stokes equation solutions, of course, depend, as you also said, on the initial conditions. Yes. Right. Yes. Now, what I didn't understand was how, what are the correct initial conditions then that you must use for any particular knot invariant? Okay, so for any particular knot, actually it comes with some representation. Mm -hmm. So for example, here, this hop link, I mean, it has some representation place on it, so R1 and R2. Mm -hmm. And then this, this condition, I have this boundary condition I have used to solve this Navier Stokes equation are this sigma 1 and sigma 2. And mm -hmm. these are basically, for our purpose, are the young tabular density of uh, those uh, representation R1 and R2. Oh, I see. I see. So the yeah, the representation gives you the initial condition. Yes, right? the representation gives me the initial I condition. See, I see. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I can't see any other hands raised. So I think we can conclude the session. So thank you, Kushal. So this is the end of this session. Okay. Uh, so okay, over so to Alok. Stop. Yeah, 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 I can. So over to Alok. All right, uh, thank you, Shanti. Thanks a lot. So can I request uh, Dilip to uh, to kindly take over the discussion that's, session? That's, Sarah, please. Let me know that's how it's low. Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Ayan. Yeah. I guess I do. Hello. Hello. Yes, do leave your audible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, so in this discussion session, we'll uh, kind of take questions uh, or if anybody wants to uh, kind of uh, elaborate on their talk. We can do uh, any of these things. So I should mention right in the beginning that uh, uh, Sergey Guka won't be around because it is too early for him in the day. I had written to him whether he would be available, but uh, I don't think uh, he would be available. But uh, uh, Laura Donay would be available, I think. Uh, and I think I can see her uh, online. Uh, the other uh, speakers were Sujay, uh, Semanti, Amitabh, Rajesh, uh, I mean Rajesh Gupta, uh, Suman Kundu, uh, Ayan Patra, Sabde Sachi, uh, Laura Dune, of course, uh, Arindam, Chatter, uh, sorry, Arindam Bhattacharji, uh, Manglesh, uh, <coughs> Aditra Banerji, and, and Kushal Chakrabarti. So, uh, so let's start with uh, the morning session. Uh, Sergey won't be around, but uh, uh, we could uh, 
Uh, sorry, Dilip, I just uh, uh, just wanted to uh, remind that Rajesh, uh, because of some emergency. Yes, Rajesh also wouldn't be around. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I, he did write to me. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. But uh, in the morning session, we have Sujay Semanti Dutta, uh, Amitabh Birmani. Uh, anybody having any questions about uh, those talks? Okay. <clears throat> if not, maybe we can uh, go to the next set of uh, speakers, like Suman Kundu. Yeah, uh, well, uh, Arnav wrote saying that he has a, a question. Uh, Arnav Kundu has a question for Semanti Dutta. Uh, Arnav, can you just uh, unmute yourself and ask? Am I audible? Uh, yes. Okay. Arna? Oh, he has to type here. Oh, he has to type probably. Yeah. Uh, so, our... Uh, uh... So are you asking, okay, sorry. Uh, so are you asking about uh, how ERG can work in DS uh, space, uh, DS safety correspondence probably? Okay, actually, wow. Yeah, so maybe I will just read out the question again. Uh, uh, is there any sense in which analytically continuing in the t, in t variable in the ERG to complex values, whether it, it makes sense? Okay. I it means not just limited, probably not just limited to just doing, say, this sitter. Yeah, okay, I understand. But uh, actually, if you can, uh, like, I don't know about analytically continuing in T variable, uh, we'll have any problem. But uh, will there, uh, if uh, someone wants to try to prove uh, DSCFT, for example, from this formalism, uh, uh, not will be quantum field theory, for example, in DSCFT will be always, it is not unitary, right? So, uh, I don't know, like, uh, if the question comes from the inspiration that uh, we can do the same thing to DSCFT kind of thing, or maybe you are telling that it's not limited to, uh, but uh, I was looking at uh, that whether this same kind of thing can be extended to DSCFT. So there I was having problem that uh, uh, this field theory at the boundary is not a unitary theory. So there it might have problem, but uh, means I don't know that uh, whether without any problem you can analytically continue the variable. Means I haven't seen anything like any work like that. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I wonder whether he has any. So is that okay or maybe I can... uh, formally? Yeah. Okay, so he's, he's written something okay. formally just as an equation. Uh, does it make sense or map to something interesting? If you do some such analytic continuation, whether it it leads to something interesting. Oh, you are telling okay T okay again you yeah, know some quantum system. So okay. Um, so if you are telling that scale is going to i in i suppose lambda is going to i lambda, right? Something like that. Then, um, so well, I think he's saying t goes to i t, so it becomes Schrodinger's equation. I don't know. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Something like that. But he's. He, 
but lambda is going to i lambda right in that case like energy is going to uh, like complex energy is he still t oh, i think he's talking about t not lambda log lambda uh, uh, so, so sorry this is very uh, very very uh, this thing you know not not sharp at all but yes i mean i was just thinking uh, at the structural level uh, as a, as an equation if i send t to i tau for example um let's forget about what it might mean or whether it's connected to decitter and what not uh, just as an equation is that is that uh, somewhat of an interesting quantity in in any sense uh, yeah it's schrodinger's equation then um, uh, e yes i mean uh, i was trying to go somewhere with with it uh, it is of course a schrodinger equation um so so uh, uh, let, let me let me ask you a, a bit more precise question to which i don't think this analytic continuation is related but uh, nonetheless let me ask anyways so is there any any sense in which for example this erg equations uh, uh, can be uh, can can be uh, can be viewed when you complexify the energy scale for example uh, or analytically continue the energy scale As, as I said, this is very vague. So you know, I'm, I'm just right. fishing for some interesting comment. That's all there is to it at this point. Not really. I mean, if you, if you just do t goes to i tau, then the uh, it's like uh, treating the action as a Hamiltonian, and then it's just Hamiltonian evolution of a quantum system. But yeah, I don't know about energy complexification. I don't know what that would do. Okay. Thank, thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Maybe I can. I can uh, probably ask a bit, bit sharper question uh, to, uh, and maybe uh, ask, yeah, sure. ask you offline. That would be probably better. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, I, I have a question regarding Rajesh's talk. I know he's not around, but someone maybe be able, able to answer it. Yeah. Like. Uh, <laughs> So it's like uh, maybe you can drop a line to Rajesh. I can send give you his email address, but uh, it's difficult for somebody else to answer his que question on his uh, seminar. No? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you. How about questions to Amitabh or Sujay? Or Suman Kundu. So, so can I can I ask a question to Suman? Uh, yes. Uh, so this is this is also uh, you know very very broad, and uh, I I would actually like to know a bit more about the details. But I'm curious about the comments uh, that that you and Shiraj were making uh, in terms of uh, trying to connect uh, you know this uh, this correlator and whatnot to to uh, uh, to a particular uh, 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 you know amplitude. Uh, uh, Regia growth uh, kind of constraint. So, uh, so I, I, I think um, I, th I think I know. Uh, uh, I understand the, the 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 statement that you made about Rindler space, and in particular this uh, this correlator growth in Regia limit and so on and so forth. But but is there a is there a sense in which you know? So so what I mean to say is that in in the CFT there are many states. The thermal states, of course, is a very nice state, but that's that's a that, let, let's put it this way. That that's a very typical state, and so on and so forth. There are many atypical states and, and you know, many interesting things you can do with CFT. Is there a geometric way of seeing what is happening in the amplitude picture uh, for each of those? Uh, you know, this is also a very naive question. I mean, I'm basically asking you to make sense of my question and give an answer. So it's really an unfair question, but uh, is, 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 is it sort of, I mean, do, do, do you see where I'm trying to maybe formulate even? as a question so uh, as a so as chaos bound is stated it is calculated for the particular thermal state and if you take a particular temperature on that uh, th thermophile double state so that is beta is equal to 2 pi that relates to a rindler space uh, structure and uh, and uh, from that Rindler space coordinate, if you go to the uh, uh, go to the corresponding, uh, uh, you know, uh, instead of Rindler time quantization, 
if you do a normal time quantization the same correlator will look like uh, will look like a time ordered correlator and uh, that's how we could have uh, uh, translated the bound to the uh, to the flat stresses matrix uh, but so, so what i'm asking is let, let's let's not think about thermal states but let's think, think about a typical state for which many correlators will behave thermally is, okay. is there any uh, i mean of course in the bulk we do not quite know uh, how to construct a typical state maybe that's where this question will get stuck or maybe yes. boiled down to but i'm just thinking i mean in terms of picture is this way of thinking does i mean does does it make uh, does it help in anything or it's just uh, uh, it's not maybe not a useful way of or not known whether it's useful to uh, to think about it no i ha i think i i have not much to say except the fact that it's a it's it's a i mean in this particular problem we could have managed to get the time order uh, with this but but no i can't say anything more than this but yeah and maybe i can just add one comment that is the the normal minkowski vacuum is the thermal state is a thermal state in riddler space that's the state we're working in so in some sense it's quite a special state yeah, yeah that, that 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 i that i understand uh, so i was i was just wondering it's just a very very vague uh, wondering really that uh, instead of that if we if we could somehow uh, you know is there a way to think about some typical state just by slicing minkowski in some some strange way oh, that's not uh, that's not the right question to ask no, I mean, it may be a good question i don't know i don't know what to say about it uh, the, the, the second thing to say is that we were eager to use the theorem that yeah. uh, that correlators in the thermal state cannot grow faster than a certain speed so for for our purposes the thermal state was you know no other state would have done the job because we didn't wouldn't have been able to use a theorem but uh, your question is a good one and i i just don't have anything useful mm -hmm. to say i mean sorry just to maybe uh, i'm kind of thinking out loud really no 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 sharp notion in mind but i'm just thinking i mean if you want to create an arbitrary state from path integral or uh, i mean it's essentially just uh, uh, i mean I, I could do it with an euclidean path integral right, right with with appropriately inserted regulators and so on and so forth so on the face of it it might look a lot like a thermal state although i mean it, of course it's not a thermal state but uh, no, I I don't have anything precise to say, but yeah. I'm just hoping the, you might have something. The states you talked about in your talk, right? Something that thermalizes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, no, it sounds interesting, and you know, there, there would continue to be the asymptotic bounds because right. if it thermalizes fast enough, you would have the same for long for long enough time behavior. You would have the same uh, growth limit. I would imagine. I'm not sure there's something for your purpose of scattering. There may or may not be something clean to learn about this. I, I just. Nothing clear to say, but it sounds sort of I, interesting. I see. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Any other questions? Could I, could I ask a question to Laura? Are we going in talk order? Sorry, please. Uh, no, 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 not necessarily. Okay. Sure, please go ahead. Uh, so, Laura, I'm going to repeat a question I asked during your talk, which maybe I didn't ask clearly enough. So let me ask again. Um, when we are studying ADS CFT, um, we allow for, for some purposes, it's useful to allow for normalizable boundary conditions. Okay. Then we're studying a state in the theory. Uh, it's a finite energy state. And uh, when, when we want to do that, we allow only normalizable boundary conditions. But for other purposes, it's sometimes useful to go beyond that, to study boundary conditions that do not correspond to any state in ADS, any finite energy state in ADS, to turn on non-normalizable modes. And uh, that uh, has a different interpretation. In that context, we know the interpretation is coupling the field theory to an operator. So uh, not trying to put flat space into ADS, but just treating flat space as an object by itself. Uh, it seemed to me that the boundary conditions you you described in the first part of your talk, the early part of your talk, were boundary conditions which described finite energy, energy states in flat space. Uh, now, I was wondering whether we could go beyond these boundary conditions, whether it makes sense to, whether it's something we want, 
we might want to do for some reason to go beyond these boundary conditions to turn on boundary conditions that were not do not correspond to finite energy states in flat space uh, and would be the conceptual analog of the non normalizable boundary conditions in ads in that context that was very useful because it got, it had a very clear field theory interpretation and i was wondering whether there may be some mileage to be gained by going beyond the kind of boundary conditions you've talked about uh, and trying to find interpretations of those for the boundary field sorry for the length of the question Yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, probably I didn't address the, the question properly be earlier. Um, yes, indeed. I think so. So basically, I think uh, basically this finite energy scattering state are captured by these uh, operators where the conformal dimension lies on the principal series uh, precisely. But um, I guess this, this other state would yeah, correspond to other other value of the of of, of delta. So, um, is is it what you had in mind that yeah? Uh, it it uh, may be, but I I was asking just from the point of view of GR. You know, you're yeah, talking yeah. about boundary conditions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I understood right, those boundary conditions are sort of tuned to capture finite energy states. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, you want to allow for yeah yeah. I think that that's uh, something interesting to do indeed. Yeah. Uh, and basically, that's what <laughs> somehow people are are doing when they are trying to relax, you know, boundary conditions and allow for uh, for extended phase space that is uh, going beyond the, the bondi messner zag or typical asymptotic symmetry uh, uh, business. Um, and then, okay, yeah, of course, you you have this. Then usually, people, typically, people in GR didn't allow it because indeed you have charges that diverge at the boundary. But now we we understand how to take care of this and to how to say renormalize, uh, you know, the, the 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 charges at infinity. So now I think people are going towards this direction. Um, it, but it's not, yeah. Um, is is it what you had in mind, like from somehow yeah. relaxing? Um, Yes, this is what I have had in mind. Again, the, with the analogy with ADS, we could just solve the linearized equations for a field near the boundary, and we find two solutions. One that corresponds, that's normalizable, it corresponds to a state. And then there's another one that sort of blows up, but we don't throw it away, we, we identify it with the source. Is there something like this in flat space? Yes, 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 there is something like that. Actually, there is a sense of which I think, yes, there there is this, this uh, this is very vague what I'm saying because I, I didn't work it out in details, but there is a sense in with you know this shadow transform somehow this this shadow transformation in the in the celestial CFT, if you look at what it does in in the bulk, somehow it 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 it's it's mapping some 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 states which have uh, you know um usual uh, let's say one of our behavior to 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 things that are overleading in powers of R. So I think this is there is probably an, a precise sense in which this non-normalizable state would correspond to do somehow a shadow tron. It's very vague what I'm saying, but I think there is precisely some there, there could be some precise statement to be done on on this uh, along these lines if that makes sense. Okay, thank you very um, much. Uh, yeah. Uh, can I can I say something, Laura? Just a uh, small yes. thing. Uh, so, yes. Shiraz, there is one qualitative difference. I mean, in the sense of what you are saying, that when we look at the uh, field equations in ADS, we get the, and we look at the you know modes near the boundary, we get a quadratic equation for the exponent, and then we get the you know it. So it has a, you can get a normalizable as well as a non-normalizable mode, right? I mean, in, the, mm -hmm. in that case. Whereas in the flat case, you, you don't get any quadratic equation for the exponent. So. If you, if you just solve it, I mean, you will get uh, only no, normalizable mode. It, it, it doesn't arise in the same way. I mean, as Laura is saying, you could have weaker follow-ups and get non-normalizable modes, but they don't come in the same way as in the ADS, where you have a quadratic equation for the exponent and, uh, you know, you can get uh, two, two solutions. One gives you normalizable and one non-normalizable mode. I see. So if you linearize the equations around the around flat space, Yeah. You never find a solution that violates your falloff conditions. Yeah, I mean, uh, if you start with weaker falloff to begin with, like you start with you know perturbations which grow as with R some power, you know that will violate. I'm just saying that you, if you start with 
let's say you start with fall off, which is one by R to the alpha, and you want to solve for alpha, which is what you will do in ABS, right? And alpha will satisfy some quadratic equation. Here, alpha will not satisfy a quadratic equation. I see. So, so, and so then how will you get that? Presumably, there exist solutions of Einstein gravity that violate these boundary conditions. How would you get those solutions? I mean, could, you, could we see those at linearized order? I if I just, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you started with weaker fall off, I mean, you, you just say that I start with, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Suppose I'm not starting with any fall off. I just take flat space. Yeah. And I just solve del square phi is equal to zero. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So you just solve and you do the large R expansion at constant U. And, you know, the equation that you will get from there is just alpha equal to minus one. I mean, one, if you have R to the alpha, and you, you get equation which gives you alpha to equal to minus one. You don't get some quadratic equation. For so that means there are no solutions to Einstein's equations that violate your, your boundary conditions? For the scalar field, I think this, I, I don't know about the you know, full GR equations. <laughs> but scalar yeah, field, Alok, I, I mean, if you look at the, the spin to conformal primary wave functions, which are solution yes. of linearized Einstein's equation uh, for any conformal dimension delta. Yes. So basically these things for the other people, these are uh, somehow uh, gauge equivalent to Mellin transform the plane wave times the helicity spin to helicity factor. Then this, this conformal, conformal primary R solution of linearized Einstein's equation. And for for delta equal to um, to one, this would be the typical fall. But, but, uh, for but they, they don't, they, they diverge in U, right? Not in R, right? I mean, I, I think uh, R oh, oh, yeah, no, they, they also diverge in R. I mean, typically I they will so. have. Um, both things and they might have also you know log of as you know very well yeah yeah but log I mean, of r and, and log of u's actually log of u over r <laughs> um but if you just look at massless scalar field equation then you know if you just do a larger expansion i mean the we don't get a quadratic equation for the exponent right i think that that is i think that's what shiraz is asking probably, right i mean yeah right okay. I, yeah but, but i actually i was even more interested in einstein linearized einstein equations just because we wanted the space time. But uh, so you, are you saying that there's a phenomenon that happens for linearized Einstein's equations that does not have a counterpart for the scalar? No, no, I don't know if the exponent, I mean, I think it's a bit different in ADS as far as I understand. I mean, in ADS, we get both modes, right? We, ah. uh, that does, I think that all that, all I'm saying is that doesn't happen. They don't, they well, don't but, come together. Sorry, what I'm not understanding, Alok, is that, uh, that, that do we see as a linearized solution that violates your boundary conditions or not? If we do, then something like that is happening, right? Yeah, it's uh, because it's null boundary. I'm not really sure if it's a good comparison with the ADS case. I mean, it's, if we uh, don't see a solution that violates your boundary conditions, then your boundary conditions are not even boundary conditions. They're just automatic, right? If it's impossible to violate them. You know, I would say you, you do. The no, no, you need, you need. No, no, you need. I'm just saying that it's not coming as the, like, they don't come in pairs. I think maybe that, that's the only thing I'm saying. That, I see. That, that, that's not coming from a quadratic equation. Yes. So, yes. Fine, fine, fine. But, but there's some, some mechanism that... Uh, yeah, yeah, that's Laura is explaining. Right, right, right. Can, yeah. can I but make I think they don't come in pairs. Yeah. Could I make one comment? So, yeah. I think the, uh, the one thing that distinguishes these modes is that I think uh, in flat space, you know, uh, in um, even in Lorentzian uh, signature, the mo one of the modes is actually blowing up in the bulk if you're solving it in RT. So, in the in uh, in uh, in Lorentzian signature in ADS, the normalizable mode is regular in the interior. So, I mean, the non-normalizable mode and the normalizable mode both are regular in the interior. But what happens in uh, flat space is that uh, regularity in the interior is still not true for, um, you know, both modes. Lorentzian signature. In the Euclidean signature, in, you know, both are, similar, roughly speaking, similar. But Chetan, they don't come in pairs. I think that is true, right? I mean, I think in ADS, they come in pairs. I think you're talking about. I'm. I'm not saying that they're, 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 you have to solve an indicial equation. I'm saying that there are two kinds ah. of solutions. Yeah, yeah. That is no. That that is that is true. And Laura is also explaining that we see them. Yeah. With these relaxed boundary conditions, like you know, of the. No, I'm just talking actually about scalar field. If you just solve the same scalar field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could. We could do that also. Why are you say they don't come in pairs? Don't you have always you know the Goldstone mode and the memory mode, which are. Somehow. Well, those are not, I mean, uh, are they, I mean, I think Sheila's question is that in the, if we solve this initial equation, like in ADS, right, I mean, we take the z to the alpha and solve for alpha, I mean, alpha solves a quadratic equation, right, z equal to zero being the boundary. So we look at the equation close to the boundary. 
and then so you have two roots for alpha and one user mm -hmm. normalized equivalent. I I I'm saying that doesn't happen. That's true. Uh, let me make a comment here. Um, uh, so if you do the spherical harmonic expansion also, then it would happen. So, okay, but you know, yeah, but that's uh, extra. <laughs> yeah, that is extra. So I mean, if if you look at uh, spherical harmonic L YLM mode, then you will have R to the L, R to the L plus one, one over R to the L plus one. These kinds of modes will come. Yeah, but not yeah. just if you do R yeah. expansion. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, just, just to follow, I'm sorry, maybe I'm taking too much time, but just to follow up, I mean, in ADS, it was very useful to turn on these non-normalizable modes. They had a clear interpretation in terms of the boundary fields there. Do you suspect that something like this might be true in flat space? I mean, are we supposed to, is it, is all we're going to be allowed to do ever throw things in and out, or are we going to be able to perturb this theory of the boundary? I, th I suppose is the question, with a sort of operated approach. No, I think as Laura is also saying that if you, there are these modes which are, uh, uh, you know, which which are definitely growing with R. If you look at, uh, you know, it's uh, modes which are Goldstone modes for sub sub leadings of gravitons, etc. So they are, um, uh, they are definitely growing with it. So there there are modes which will diverge the asymptotic flatness naively, but. Uh, yeah. And do you think that they will end up having an interesting physical interpretation? That at the moment we just set them to zero. But when we think harder, we'll one we'll identify their values with some. No, I think I think in this W infinity, maybe Laura can say more that she talked about. I don't. We are not setting them to zero. So they, these are it, the, the symmetry generators which give you this, you know, these higher symmetries which she talked about uh, beyond BMS. Uh, those symmetry generators diverge with R with powers of R. So you know, uh, if you go beyond BMS, then you get this. Symmetry generators which go with R square, R cube, etc. So those are, and those are conjugate to the, uh, you know, the Goldstone modes for that symmetry. So, so they, they are already present uh, in the in the theory. Is that what you're asking, uh, Shiva? Yeah, yeah, I suppose that's what I'm asking. And I was asking what the, you know, for instance, could a, could any an experimentalist ever turn on these modes? Is this yeah, I guess they would be the imprint would be memory effects, which but. The higher somehow the counter is that the higher, the less normalizable the state would, they correspond to sub, uh, they would correspond to sub leading in our memory effects. But I think that that's the observable that will capture these these things. So um, as as uh, Alok was showing that, you know, you have the, um, uh, you have this tower of overleading symmetry parameters that blow up more and more with R. And they are all canonically paired with another mode, which uh, capture precisely uh, memory effects. But these memory effects will be uh, subleading in, in in R. So you have you know this displacement memory and then the what people have called spin memory and probably a whole tower of things that that will show up at lower. So it will be even more and more difficult to probe. But I, I would say that's the thing that would capture that. Okay, last question, and I'll shut up. Uh, so, so, Shira, sorry, I can just add something to what, what Laura said. So, yeah, if yeah, you at, yeah, if, if you just look at QED and uh, if you if you just look at um, if you just look at a tree level uh, scattering, so if you forget the loop effects, then there are these conservation laws which are basically telling us that the field strength, which goes as one by R to the n, you know, uh, is is in a in a precise way conserved between scry plus scry minus. So the mode conjugate to that grows as R to the you know, R to some power. So 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 those are the norm normalizable modes that uh, arise. These are these higher W. I mean analogs of this W infinity symmetry she talked about in QED. Uh, 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 but only for three level amplitudes. I mean you know we, we, we can we can see these conservation laws explicitly, and the modes conjugate are these modes that diverge with R. Okay, absolutely. Let, absolutely. Let me, since, uh, Shiraz, can I make one more comment about? I think it may be related to what you're saying because, um, so the uh, the if it's the, the the analog of uh, uh, you know one analog one way to generalize this uh, source uh, you know uh, normalizable versus non normalizable is to so solve instead of a Dirichlet like boundary value problem. If you solve a, an actual source problem in the box. So, so in ADS, we typically solve a Dirichlet boundary value problem, but instead of that, you solve a, the, the, the wave equation, but with a bulk source. And if you solve that, what you find is that the mode that, you know, there are, as I said, in Lorentzian signature, there are two modes. One of them diverges in the bulk, but all both of them 
um, you know, die down at infinity. So the one that diverges in the bulk is it corresponds to the source, and the one that, uh, for example, I mean, the one that we typically talk about corresponds to the one, uh, you know, the homogeneous mode. So there is a homogeneous mode that dies down, and the so the one that is sourced by the bulk source is the one that is, uh, you know, uh, dies down at. Uh, is the one that is singular on the bulk and dies down to infinity. So this is, these are the two, the re, both of them die down to infinity and that's the reason why, as uh, Alok was saying, it's not, you know, there's nothing to distinguish them from the boundary, sort of. Okay, okay. And so just my final question is, is it, it's, I get the sense from what all of you are saying from Alok and Laura and Chetan, that, that uh, uh, though you started with certain boundary conditions, you're now actually dealing with fields that violate those boundary conditions. You know, it's a sort of, if I understood right from the structure of your talk, you said, these are my boundary conditions. I'm going to start with things that that ma maintain these fall-offs. And now you're saying that these, I don't know, high-end yes. operators violate mm -hmm. these boundary conditions. So what are the rules? I mean, are, are we developing the rules as we go along? Or? Yes. Um, <laughs> yes. So indeed, if you want to capture certain aspect of the subsector, like as I was saying, like the subleading and sub subleading of graviton theorem, for instance, you will have to allow for uh, modes that violate bondi messner zeck expansion. And and uh, if you ev even want to be able to see this, these things, it was already the case for, you know, this stress tensor guy corresponds to poor rotation, which, which uh, already involves some violation of the fall off. Uh, so you have to allow to to change the round sphere metric, uh, and then you will allow to 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 violate more and more the fallout. So, what are the rules of the game, and how this is something that we are figuring out on the way? I would say, like, how far we can go, and what you know, what what are the most general con boundary conditions you can have that capture all the physical observables? That's something with, uh, where I think it's we are trying to figure out. Yeah. Thank you. So can I just add add, add, add something, uh, Shira? So. Uh, I mean, if we look at, I mean, to at the extent we understand these things that, you know, it, it, for example, as Laura is saying, the super rotation, naively, it seems like they violate this follow up. But what they do not violate is the asymptotic flatness. So even though they violate this bond D match, uh, you know, BMS type expansion, if you look at the metric you get after a super rotation and you compute the wild tensor, it still falls off as you would expect for an asymptotically flat. Space time. So one adds some extra modes on the sphere at infinity such that the while doesn't. So the rules of the game, at least to the extent we understand it, is that we do not want to somehow, we want to not spoil the asymptotic flatness because we know that, you know, even if you have soft radiation at, you know, in soft expansion, we don't, it will not mess up with the asymptotic flatness, right? So, so uh, 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 you know, it, it, it's, it may violate the BMS expansion of the metric, but not the flatness. I mean, so that's the one strong constraint one has that, uh, and we understand it well up to super rotation. I think that, uh, but, uh, no, not for the this W infinity symmetries that we don't exactly know, right? I mean, Laura, is that correct? Say Sorry, it, like one quick qu question, kind of a follow up. So this, if you are interested in this, uh, I mean, if you want to think of this setup as uh, and try uh, in analogy with this more conventional ADS CFT that is you have source and response, uh, that would require time, right? But this dual theory, proposed theory seems to not have time. It's just a two dimensional one. So, 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 so how is this, uh, how would this question eventually tie up to this, uh, you know, if one wants such an interpretation for the boundary CFT? Well, there is a notion of, very... of time evolution anyway, but, um... There, so there is an operator on the celestial sphere which 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 uh, accounts for time evolution. It's it's this operator that shifts the dimension delta actually by one unit. So there is still the the time evolution is still encoded, but it's, as I uh, and I was trying to to say that it's indeed the the fact that we are using this Mellon transform makes the 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 you know the time evolution repackaged in a very uh, weird way, but it's it's still there. So. One would have to understand precisely what it means um, in terms of the the spectrum, but but it's still encoded. That's encoded. I see. You're saying the time dimension would be encoded in the continuity of the conformal dimension spectrum. Yes. So yes. so 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 uh, uh, in order to see this more transparently, you would uh, propose that you change a basis again back to time coordinate. 
and that's, then you would you would have yeah. a more manifest dynamics yeah exactly so basically there are different ways one could try to attempt that space holography i mean this celestial uh, picture is is uh, making the you know the conformal <laughs> symmetry manifest and then you can use all the machinery of of usual cft but then you have to deal with this uh with this spectrum and this uh, weird uh, effect of super translations uh, you might want to try directly formulated theory on, on scry on the infinity and that's a that's a also a possibility and you know you, you 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 would gain something you would lose others so it's good to look at the different angles okay thank you okay uh, there are a couple of questions in the chat uh, so one of them says that uh, for asymptotically flat uh, sorry uh, uh, it says that like if the symmetries are not the symmetries or the gravitational asymmetries, can someone comment on the relevance of the, them for the scattering problem? This is probably in the context of W1 plus infinity, which is probably not a symmetry of the classical uh, uh, scattering. Any comments about that? Hello. Mm, yeah. Um, I mean, for sure, the the very first, you know, um, I I I don't know what these are, but for, for sure, the the very the first, you know, towers, the leading subleading sub subleading were shown to be symmetry of gravitational asymmetrics modulo some some subtleties. Um, so, so maybe so, I can expand actually. Uh, I think on this question, yeah, Maras, I think the, yeah. the thing is that the in this W infinity, at least one manifestation that was you know worked out by I don't know if Shamik is there in the audience and Partha and others that you break the super translation charge into these currents, right? The uh, you know three currents, um, uh, you know this holomorphic anti holomorphic currents. I mean, uh, each, each the single charge is broken up into various pieces and. And those are not conserved, right? Individually, I mean, you know, the, the this is not the old super translation current of Steve Berger and Taylor, but you know, further split, chiral split of these currents into different components, which seem to generate this W infinity algebra, right? Uh, oh yeah, because it's uh, just a uh, say holomorphic sector or something. Like yeah, yeah, something like that. I mean, you split the soft factor into like two pieces, and one is the current uh, plus one. And you know, one is one minus one, and those are not conserved. Right? I mean, those are not the, uh, clearly not conserved because there's some more, you know, some combination is conserved between scry plus. And oh plus. yeah, now I understand the question. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, mm -hmm. so in that context, I think the question. Is... Okay, uh, can I ask something related? So, uh, what is the status of uh, super rotations at uh, space-like infinity? Do we have a realization of that? A spatial infinity um for rotations yeah i so i don't think it has been worked well maybe i look yeah so maybe but but no, I, yeah I there is uh, yeah yeah it's just one thing i mean in perturbative gravity i think only amitabh we understand not like it in full gr unlike super translations we do not have a yeah. conservation it might be possible to extend the result of you know a no and in perturbative, yes, gravity, in perturbative gravity, the asymptotic equations of motion in, in I guess you do it in the bike schmidt coordinates or something of that type. So uh, asymptotic equations of motions are satisfied or how does Yeah, that... yeah, we work, I mean, you can work in the Dunder gauge and, you know, you can, uh, you can derive this large gauge transformation, right? So you, uh, uh, and you can write down the charges, which are really the moments of the wild tensor at u equal to minus and v equal to plus infinity. And then you can show that the, they are conserved at least in perturbative. Uh, but you know, it's it's not. Uh, I don't think there's a proof as Laura is saying in full GR. Uh, I mean, no, but I think it's it, like I same as in QED. So, you know, it can be shown. Not at the same. Yeah, not at the same extent. I mean, but I think so, something that is coming. Yeah. So the reason, the, the main reason I am asking is that if you do the asymptotic expansion of Einstein's equations at space like infinity in this. Uh, no, that's not what uh, that's not what is done. Uh, I mean, you you do the expansion. You are getting writing these charges as scry plus and scry minus, and mm -hmm. then as as I think she was explaining, you are writing them as angular momentum aspect at 
u equal to minus n v equal to plus infinity, and then you want to show that the uh, you know at i naught, if you look at the equations at i naught uh, as a hyperbola, then you want to show that this aspect is conserved, which in linearized theory one can show. It, or, or, Okay, but the metric that you have on the hyperboloid that yeah. does not solve Einstein's equations, asymptotic Einstein's equations. No, uh, it will solve, I think, uh, Einstein's equation. Uh, okay. But we can, we can, yeah, we can chat. Off. I mean, it's like, I'm, yeah, in QED it has been shown. I, I would think it would be similar to QED case, at least linear. I think. Okay, so there's a question from Somdatta. Somdatta, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, so <clears throat> so I, I would like to tie in what Laura said at the end of her talk with the rest of the uh, other talks. Uh, she said at the end of the talk that maybe uh, it's worth exploring the soft modes on the horizon of a black hole. And I, I was just thinking whether these tensionless strings uh, which uh, I mean, the ordinary strings be which become tensionless at the horizon of the black hole, maybe they can uh, supply some of those soft modes. I, I don't know. Because the spectrum uh, of those tensionless strings, uh, they are kind of, I don't know, they are massless to start with, but uh, to, be, be, to be soft, the energies would have to go to zero. So, I don't know, but maybe people can discuss things on these lines. Yeah, maybe there are some interesting connections there. I don't have any, some, anything smart to say on that. Then. Okay, uh, maybe you can uh, ask Alok Mishra to ask a question. He also put his hand up. Yeah, hi. Uh, sorry, I was um, uh, virtually running around, uh, so I, I missed uh, a few things, but uh, I just wanted to, uh, it's, I know it's pretty late, but I just wanted to uh, um, squeeze in a comment uh, related to these non-normalizable non modes that Shiraz was asking about. I, and by providing a context in which uh, they've been found to exist. So if, for example, one looks at uh, these um, generalizations of uh, clavinor strassler geometries, especially the ones uh, in the gravitational side, which involve a resolved what deformed conifold, and one tries to construct their n-theory uplift, and then one looks at uh, um, scalar gauge invariant combinations of scalar perturbations, then one can actually show that if, you're, you, if you have a black hole in the background, uh, uh, then uh, if you, you talk about relating the resolution parameter of the S2 blow up in the geometry with the horizon radius, and uh, what happens is that the equations of motion for these uh, scalar metric perturbations involve the, uh, the horizon appearing as an irregular singular point. So uh, if you try to actually solve uh, uh, the equations of motion, then you would see that if you if you take an ansatz in which uh, you say that, uh, and you also have non-conformality in the setup. So if you say that uh, the resolution parameter, which is the radius of the S2 blow up, is related directly to the horizon radius uh, uh, up to uh, non-conformality corrections, then you get uh, good modes. But if you actually say that uh, the, uh, the resolution parameter is related uh, to the horizon radius through the non-conformality factor, then you turn out to uh, have a non-normalizable board. So I just wanted to throw in one context where that appears. Anybody? Uh, Sucheta has a hand up. Maybe Sucheta wants to ask a question. Sucheta, maybe you can ask a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. 
Uh, great. Uh, hi, Laura. Thanks for the very nice talk. I, I was just uh, thinking so uh, in light of all the questions that we just had now. And uh, so when, you, when we think of celestial holography, it's said that we are comparing the 4D gravity theory to this 2D celestial CFT. But in what sense is it fair to actually say it's a 2D theory? Because you know uh, we still need a time, a sense of a time direction, right? Uh, one cannot describe all all the features of our 4D scattering amplitudes or soft theorems uh, just on the uh, just in terms of these two coordinates on the celestial sphere. You still need a uh, sense of time. So is it not a 2D CFT, but also with the preferred no direction uh, of time or something? Uh, yes, yeah, so um, um, uh, maybe, sorry, if I'm repeat, myself, but there is the, you, you see, there is the, the, the time evolution is still encoded. That's something that maybe we don't emphasize enough or we don't explain well when we talk about that, but um, you see the, 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 tr the translation or the time evolution is, uh, is an operator which is, uh, has a well-defined um, form. It's exponential of partial delta, where delta is the, is the um, conformal dimension of the celestial operators. So, so it's, it's needed formulated on a 2D, on a 2D uh, sphere. But the time evolution is encoding and is precisely making all this funny mixture and this continuous spectrum in, in delta. Uh, and again, as I was saying, that it, it, it might be, it, there might be another proposal for flat space holography, which is like, you know, more uh, field theory living on, 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 on null infinity. And I don't think these are necessarily, you know, incompatible uh, point of views. Uh, but so just to emphasize, we do have this, uh, um, we, we do have time evolution and there is a precise sense in which you can, you can see, for instance, I don't know, uh, you could see, you know, the bondy mass loss formula in terms of, of celestial, uh, celestial holography. This should be able to encode it. Everything is complicated because you have, as you know, fluxes going out, non-conservation of charges and stuff, but um, it's, it's there. It's, it's, it has to be there. I see. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, just to understand correctly, uh, do you know how these BMS fluxes or the change in the bondy mass aspects is encoded in the uh, celestial picture? Is it already known? I, I didn't get the point, sorry. Yeah, so, um, so basically, what we managed to, to, to understand with Romain is that um, yeah. These, um, these currents, you know, these 2D currents, these uh, super translation currents, stress tensor and so on, are what they are naturally from the point of view of the gravity solution space are precisely these fluxes for So for instance, the, um, the super translation current is related to the integration of the time derivative of the bondy mass aspect corrected by some terms. It's actually uh, related to a vial. Um, whatever, to the, to the Newman-Penrose constant. But um, mm -hmm. so there is a precise mapping between BMS fluxes, uh, so time differences of these things at square plus plus and square plus minus and, and the soft and the soft modes. Um, so this, this, this is, uh, yeah, this is well understood. Please, please. Okay, okay, I see. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Maybe to other speakers? I was just wondering whether these, uh, uh, this, uh, de uh, the degeneracy of the world sheet action, when the determinant of the world sheet metric goes to zero and the action reduces to x dot mu, x dot mu, whether, uh, on the surface of a black hole, the action would reduce to x dot u, x dot u, where u is t minus r, because uh, particles are traveling at the speed of light on the surface of the black hole, and t minus r is the right coordinate, right? The light cone coordinate which parameterizes such motions. So I was just wondering whether on the surface of the black hole, the action 
degenerates to x dot u x dot u. I don't know. Yes, yeah, that is a question addressed to whom? Uh, people working on uh, in, in, this in, thing or? Yeah, the, the, the session that followed uh, at the end, uh, after Laura's talk. Okay. All the people. It had, all the I think it's for Aritro. Aritro or Mang Manglesh or something. Yeah, Aritro or Manglesh. Okay. Ma yeah, so I don't know what, what do you mean by x dot u x dot u. Do you mean like del u x del u x? Hello? Well, I suppose he means that u is the only uh, light cone coordinate that you have. Right, right. So, so yeah, in, in, in general, you could also have, uh, let's say, a BMS symmetry on shell for that sort of action. For example, I mean, if you only have like, let's say, sigma minus, not sigma minus, like x minus coordinates left, then you can still write down a, a, a a sort of a chiral sort of theory on one of the light cone directions and uh, from the uh, constraint analysis i think that will still give you uh, bms symmetries uh, like for example these ambitwister strings that we have been talking about you know in uh, different con contexts uh, that those are actually uh, they those actually have that sort of structure where uh, only one of the in, in the in the so only one of the like either z or z bar survives and you have half of a cft action basically just del x whole square or del bar x whole square yeah so algebraically, that's algebraically that is algebraically that is my idea that you still have a null metric there and you can you can you can have uh, bms symmetries from from there uh, but yeah, physically, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I don't know, you know, your other question about so this. Uh, the understanding that the, on the surface of the black hole, the spectrum would reduce to that of the ambitwister string. Uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure about that. I, I, I can just give you an algebraic comment that this is, this is what happens. But I, 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 I cannot tell you that, you know, when you, uh, uh, maybe, yeah, sorry, I, 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 I don't have anything more intelligent to say about this uh this is this is uh yeah yeah i mean you can uh, what you can probably do is probably take a scalar field and try to try to put it in a, a inherently carol background i mean you can take a, a carol background with carol diffeomorphisms uh, and put try to put the scalar field on top of that and see that the most general action hold that you get from that uh, whether whether those are BMS symmetries or not. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so it's already quarter to seven. Uh, maybe we can wind up this uh, discussion session. Uh, so I would like to thank all the speakers today for uh, uh, being here for the uh, discussion session. Uh, but uh, it's. Uh, it's time for us to close the session now. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, over to Alok. Right. Uh, I think uh, what I had requested is probably uh, is happening. Uh, so essentially, uh, uh, I would uh, humbly request that those of us who are not on the ISM 2011 Google group should kindly exit. If you haven't heard of this Google group, that makes you a prime ca candidate to indeed exit. That just means uh, you're not on the group. So, and um, I would also request our tech support team to exit right away. And I'll let you know uh, towards the end, uh, uh, that you can just uh, come in when we are done and uh, we'll just uh, end the recordings, et cetera. I don't want to goof up. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So um, I, um, I'm assuming that, uh, okay, Shubham, you must exit, please. Yeah, Trakshu maybe. 
Shubham Sudarshan, Shubham Sudarshanam, please exit. Rakshu. Anwar Sheikh. And uh, Dilip is going to continue as the uh, uh, the GBM chair. So over uh, uh, to, back to Dilip. Uh, Anwar, yeah. Anwar Sheikh and Trakshu uh, are there. Uh, I mean, I mean uh, okay. I if you have way yeah. of. Uh, yeah, Alok, as a host, you have a permission to uh, to remove them. Maybe they are not in front of their computer or something. Acha, acha. So can I, I hope it's not impolite, so I'm removing Trakshu. Uh, yes, you can oh. uh, remove Anwar. I think Anwar is, yeah. Uh, okay, is Trakshu gone? I can remove his. Anwar. Uh, Anwar. Remove. Okay, I think Anwar should also be gone. Okay. So it's back to you, uh, Dilip, please. Okay, so uh, so this meeting uh, is basically to uh, discuss. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Are you live streaming on YouTube? Can we just. Uh, yeah, uh, should. Okay, should we not do that? Oh, I had no idea. Okay. Yeah, maybe we should not. No? Then it doesn't. It's the same thing. Okay, um, so uh, let's see. I stopped the recording. Are you sure you want to stop? Yeah, recording? stop recording. Yeah. The cloud. Yes. And uh, there's this live. Oh, okay. I live and custom stop live stream. So I I, I ended the Zoom recording. Now I'm ending the.